Rise. This Honorable Superior Court for the Judicial District of Stanford at Stanford, a transaction of criminal business is now open and in session. The Honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. Ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Counsel, stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. We continue with the state's case. Thank you, Your Honor. State would call Salvatore Cavalier, please. While he's coming in, may I approach the clerk, Your Honor? Yes. Salvatore Cavallari, uh, S-A-L-V-A-T-O-R-E. My last name is Cavallari, C-A-V-A-L-I-E-R-E. Cavallari, you may have a seat in the witness box, please. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm oh, well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cavallari, uh, I'm going to draw your attention back to 2019. In 2019, did you uh, own or rent property on Deercliff Road in Avon? I did. Specifically, what address? Uh, 376, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. What kind of property was that? Um, it's It was a 31-acre lot with a garage and a farmhouse on it. What part of that property uh, did you, I guess, have control over? Um, the garage. Where was the garage located? Um, right next to the road on uh, Deer Cliff. Did you have any video surveillance on that garage? Yes, I did. What was the video surveillance? Could you please, please explain? Um, I had a uh, night owl uh, security system. I had two cameras on the outside of the building, uh, one on the gable end and one in the soffit. What areas did those video cameras encompass? Um, one camera, the one on the gable end, was parallel to Deer Cliff Road and got um, traffic coming at it and away from it. And then on the um, soffit, it was more perpendicular with the road and kind of got everything going left and right, but more of a side view versus head on. Did you have those video cameras in place on May 24th, 2019? Yes. Was that camera system internet based or hardwired into the property? Internet. Was the video or camera surveillance system a continuous stream or motion activated? Continuous. And do you know if the time was accurate? I believe it was, yes. And at some point, did you meet with detectives regarding your video camera? I did. Did you provide them with the video camera system? 
Yes, I did the hard drive. Okay. And did you get your hard drive back? Yes, I did. May I just have a moment? Yes. Um, states 123, Your Honor, I would ask to move into evidence. I don't believe there's any objection at this time. Page 123, admitted as full. Sir, just a couple of questions. With respect to 376 Deer Cliff Road, is that in any way located near Jefferson Crossing in Farmington? Yeah, I would say approximately a mile, mile and a half down the road. By down the road, is it south or north or? Um, north, I would say, towards Hartford direction. Uh, it states 123. Just going to open a map behind you, sir, if you could. Just is 376 Deer Cliff Road on that map? Yes, it is. If you could, wouldn't you mind please standing up and pointing to it? And Jefferson Crossing. Thank you. You can have a seat, sir. Your your seat's going to open states 9 123, file marked 376 Deer Cliff, 1757 Fraught. Sir, if you could take a look at the screen behind you. Um, what are we looking at? That would be the, um, the soffit and camera on the front of the garage. Um, <clears throat> And that would be Deer Cliff Road at the top of the screen. So the white part on the right side of the screen is at the garage? Yes, it is. Okay. And Deer Cliff, you said it is at the road going from the upper left to the right of the screen? Correct. Uh, Jefferson Crossing, is that towards the left side of the screen or towards the right side of the screen if you were? Um, that would be to the left side. Okay. And then you indicated, sir, you had one other camera? Yes. Well, so it's going to play file mark 376 Deer Cliff, 1757 side. And again, sir, what are we looking at? Uh, that would be the camera on the gable end of the garage uh, facing Deer Cliff. And that road going from the left to the bottom right at this point, is that Deer Cliff? Yes, it is. And Jefferson Crossing, where would that be on the left or the right side of the screen? Uh, it would be on the top left. Okay. Now, on the upper left, there is the date and time, uh, 5-24-2019 and then 17-57. Uh, is that correct time, sir? I believe so, yes. Okay. I'm just going to hit play. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. If nothing further. No questions. Cavalier, you can step down. <clears throat> The state calls for Val Gamini.
raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got our upon penalty of perjury? Yes. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Pablo Gomez. P-A-W-E-L-G-U-M-I-E-N-N-Y. Okay, sir, you may be seated. Good morning, Mr. Gamini. Good morning. I'm just going to ask that you keep your voice up so that every member of the jury can hear you, okay? <clears throat> Mr. Gamini, um, first of all, are you nervous being here? Yes. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Poland. Where in Poland? Um, in, I don't know how to explain. Near Krakow? <clears throat> it's a small town. And how old are you, sir? I am 43. What year did you come to the United States? 2000. In 2000. Are you married? Yes. Do you have children? I have two children, 13 and 16. And where do you currently reside? In uh, Sainsbury. Are you residing at the uh, same residence that you resided at in 2019? Yes. What is that address, sir? 27 Springbrook. <clears throat> I'm sorry? 27 Springbrook. Okay. I'm just going to ask again if you just keep your voice up just a little bit, okay? <clears throat> What do you do for a living? I'm a carpenter. And how did you begin to work as a carpenter? When I moved here in um, 2000, this is where I started doing. When you moved here in 2000 and started working as a carpenter, were you working for a particular contractor? Yes, I started working for a, for a small company. What was the name of the company? Dream Builders. What type of work did Dream Builders do? Framing. And when you say framing, what do you mean? It's the, um, the structure of the house. And did you have any experience with this in Poland? No. So you kind of learned it when you got here? Yeah. How did you get the job? Uh, through some friends. And how long did you work for that company? Is it Dream Builders? Yes. Um, I think I stopped working there around 2008 or 9. When you were working for Dream Builders, did you do anything besides framing houses? Um, yeah, I was doing like small side jobs. What types of side jobs? Um, like windows replacement, doors replacement, um, decks and that kind of stuff. Now you indicated that you came to the United States in 2000. Have you been back to Poland since 2000? Yes. How many times? Uh, I believe like three or four. And have you traveled with your family back to Poland? Yes. Incidentally, were your children born here, born here or were they born in Poland? They were born here. You mentioned that you were working for Dream Builders from 2000 until approximately 2008, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever, uh, during that time period, meet someone named Fotis Dulos? Yes. <clears throat> approximately what year did you meet him? I want to say around 2004. How did you meet him? I met his sister first. She was uh, managing... She, he's a uh, job sites. She was architect by trade. Um, and shortly after, I met Forrest. What was Mr. Julius' sister's name? Rena. That's how they started the company. F-O-R-E, four group, Fortis and Rena. <clears throat> and can you just, uh, what's the name? Four, four group. No, no, the, the sister's name, I'm sorry. Rena. Oh. And uh, did you meet her through your work at Dream Builders? Yes. Was Mr. Dulos' sister um, an owner of Four Group at that point? I'm not sure. I think they were co-owners or I'm, I'm not sure the details. 
And so did Dream Builders do work for Four Group? I believe so, yes. Did you do work for Four Group as part of Dream Builders? I was working paid by Dream Builders and Dream Builders was building a, uh, framing a house for Four Group. Okay. And was this again in approximately 2004? I believe so, yeah. How many, um, well, strike that. Did Dream Builders do any other projects with Ford Group over the years? Yes. How many would you say approximately? Can't remember. So were you an employee of Ford Group while you were framing houses for Dream Builders? No. Now, at some point, did you leave Dream Builders? Yes. What year was that? I think around 2008 or 9. And why did you leave Dream Builders? I wanted to start my own work. And by start your own work, what did you do? I started framing. What was the name of your company? So I was just working under my name. Did you have any employees? No. How would you get work? Um, through people that I that I knew. Did you do any work for Four Group as uh, your own company? Yes. Incidentally, were you keeping in touch with Mr. Dulos during this time period? What do you mean? What time period? So um, from the time that you worked at Dream Builders until approximately 2010 when you started your own company, were you in contact yes, with Mr. Dulos? Yes, yes. Well, would call me every, every now and then, you know, like install a door or do this or do that, like small jobs here and there. And so for how long did you have your own framing company? Um, I was working under my own name until uh, 2016 when I uh, when I started working for for group on the books. What was significant about 2016 when you began working? I uh, I got my green card. <laughs> now you indicated that Mr. Julius would call you to do odd jobs. Did you also frame any houses for four group during yes. that time period? Yes. How many houses would you say you framed? Uh, I can't remember. Eight, ten. And what was your relationship with Four Group at this point? Were you a subcontractor? Yes. Did there come a point in time where Mr. Dulos offered you a job at Four Group? Yes. And what year was that? So I started working um, as an employee in 2016, but <coughs> prior to that, I think around mid-2014, um, he'll have me like uh, help other managers manage the projects. And I think in 2015, I was, I was, um, I was managing projects by myself. And were you still um, framing houses on your own time as well? Or were you pretty much dedicated to I was pretty much dedicated to, to four group. And you mentioned managing projects. Can you just explain to the members of the jury what you mean by that? So it's a whole process of um, building a house from, from clearing the, the land to foundation, um, building the house to all the way finish to basically when you're new owners can move in, managing every aspect of that work. Did that include uh, putting out bids for subcontractors as well? Yes. Did you ever meet someone named Jennifer Dulos? Yes. When did you meet her approximately? Shortly after I met Fotis. <laughs> so uh, around 2004? Yes. And Mr. Dulos and Jennifer were married, is that correct? I think so. 
When you met Mr. Dulos and Jennifer, where were they living, if you recall? Um, I think they were living in A1. I don't remember the address. And did you ever meet any of the Dulos children? Yes. How old were the children when you met them? Well, I, got, I was, I was kind of meeting them um, I I don't remember I like they were they were little but okay so they were young young yeah. children all right were any of them born actually since you met Mr. Dulos yes and um, did you ever have opportunities to interact with Jennifer Dulos occasionally yes how would you describe her. She was a good person, um, delicate, nice, friendly. Now, did there come a point in time where um, the Dulos has moved to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Do you remember approximately when that was? No. Where was Fort Group's office located prior to Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe it was... Uh, <laughs> Five Charlotte Court. Um, I don't remember the, the time, but it was prior to. And then did the office move to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Above the garage, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever, um, well, firstly, did you have a desk in the office? Yes. And did you ever meet someone named Lauren Almeida? Yes. How did you meet Lauren Almeida? She was a babysitter for, for Dulos family. Did she do anything else for the Dulos family? I think at some point she was um, doing like a punch list and, and maybe tried to manage some of the projects. As an employee of Four Group? Yes. Now, um, did you ever do uh, odd jobs for Jennifer around Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, a lot. What types of things would you do for Jennifer? Pretty much anything uh, to do with the house. Um, she would call me, um, you know, as simple as replace a light bulb to, you know, I remember I was building a swing set on the back for the kids. Um, I would drive her a lot to Boston Airport or Things like that. That's... You mentioned that you would uh, drive her a lot to the airport. What vehicles would you drive her in? Um, I'm not sure, but I think my, mainly would be the Suburban. Suburban have a little bit more space? When we were driving with the kids, then we would take the Suburban. Now, did there come a point in time when you met someone named Michelle Traconis? Yes. Do you see Ms. Traconis in the courtroom? Yes. Would you just point her out and uh, tell us what color shirt she has on? Um, great. Judge, you identified the defendant. Thank you. Now, there, there came a point in time when Jennifer moved out of Fort Jefferson Crossing, correct? Yes. Did you meet the defendant before or after Jennifer moved out of Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe after. And do you remember approximately when that was? No. Do you remember approximately how long after Jennifer moved out you met her? No, I, I can't recall it. And when you um, met the defendant, where did you meet her? I believe she walked into the office with uh, with photos. And how would you describe her at that point? Objection B. Sustained. Well, was she friendly? Yes. You mentioned that Jennifer moved out at some point. I want to uh, direct your attention now to Mr. Dulos and Jennifer's relationship. Did there come a point in time when uh, Mr. Dulos indicated to you that he and Jennifer were going to be separating? Yes. 
Do you remember when that was? I remember we were having a team meeting in the office, and then uh, he announced it to everybody that uh, they are separating. Was Jennifer still living in the house at this point? Yes. And did Jennifer ever make any requests from you during that time period? Yes, she would um, um, ask me to move some of the stuff from her house to um, her family owned a house, I, I think it was Palm Bridge, house on the lake. So she would ask me a number of times to move some things from her house to, to the lake house. And would you do that for her? Yes. Why? Because I like her and I wanted to help out. Did you tell Mr. Dulos that you were doing this? No. Why not? At some point I told Jennifer that I have to stop doing that because this is going to get me fired. And how did she react when you told her that? Uh, first she joked, she said, uh, that's okay, so I'll have you to go and uh, renovate the house. If I'm going to object to your say. It's a joke. I, I don't see how it's offered for its truth, Judge. Oh, well, then I'll withdraw the objection. What did she joke? She said, that, then I'll have you uh, renovate my house in Palm Beach. But after that conversation, did you ever move anything from her again? I don't think so, no. Incidentally, um, you mentioned that you had driven Jennifer in the Suburban. Did you ever drive her in your Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? Yeah, so uh, I think shortly prior to the voice, um, she um, bumped into something with her Range Rover. And uh, she asked me if I could get some paint and touch up the bumper so Dulos wouldn't see it. Um, and I said that I have a friend who's mechanic um, who lives in Berlin, and he can like fix the bumper and make it look like never ever happened for like four hundred dollars. And she said, "Okay, so uh, so this is when I drove my truck, and she drove the Range Rover to New Britain. And then once we left the Range Rover there, I gave a ride in my truck back to Fort Jones. And you indicated that this was prior to the divorce, so I want to just clear this up." This was prior to her moving out of the house, correct? Yes. And can you recall any other time she was ever in your Tacoma? When um, when I drove her back to pick up the to rent over. Sure, other than that particular interaction. I don't recall it. Did Mr. Dulos ever talk to you about his divorce with Jennifer? You, like, can you rephrase the question? What do you mean by that? Well, did Mr. Dulos ever indicate to you how the divorce proceedings were going or anything like that? Yes. What types of things would he say? Um, he would say, like... Uh, you know, I'm going to object only on, not to the... You're saying I'm going to object for the, without a time frame. Apparently, this went out for a while. Well... The question was, did he ever talk to this witness about the divorce? Now, the court does not know uh, what counsel's uh, frame is. The filing of the divorce, the proceedings after the filing. Perhaps you can sharpen the question. Yes, sir. Get it. Mr. Gamini, did Mr. Dulos ever talk to you about picking up his children in New Canaan? And whether or not there were any cameras at Jennifer's house. Um, I mean, object to the. It's a complex question with two <clears throat> portions. Well, well, I'm trying to. I was asked to sharpen the question, so I'm trying to do that. Uh, the question has been sharpened, but there are two points. Sure. So if you can just ask one point at a time. Did Mr. Dulos ever uh, speak 
with you or anyone else in your presence about cameras at Jennifer's home in New Canaan? Yes. Approximately when was that conversation? I don't remember exactly. Um, I think it was like a month or two prior to Jennifer's disappearance. Where did this conversation take place? In the office. Was anyone else present for this conversation? Yes. Who was present? Dan Zeisler. Who is Dan Zeisler? It's an audio video guy. Contractor. Sorry? Contractor who does audio and video. Specializes in... So sort of a subcontractor for Core Group? Yes. Tell the jury exactly what was said during this conversation. So I believe I was... Yeah, I'm um, object on hearsay grounds. Well, uh, first, what was said in the conversation is, as the court understands it, is going to involve three people. So that question is quite broad. Let me uh, see if I can ask another question, Judge. So I'll withdraw the previous question. When um, this conversation took place, were you present for the entirety of the conversation? Or did you walk in on it? I'm not sure if I walked in and I, if I was sitting in, in, uh, in the office and they walked in. I, I don't recall it. And when they walked in, could you hear what Mr. Doulos was saying to Mr. Zeisler and what Mr. Zeisler was saying to Mr. Yes. Doulos? What was Mr. Doulos saying to Mr. Zeisler? He showed Judge, him um, hearsay. If I may judge, this yes. is not being offered for its truth. Rather, it's being offered to show the apparent concern that Mr. Dulos had over Jennifer potentially having cameras. So I'm not offering it to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but merely the fact that he was concerned that she had cameras is what's probative in this case. The problem, of course, is what Mr. Dulos's uh, internal motive was for making hearsay statements is not before the court here through this witness, and therefore it is an inappropriate question of this witness. I will also note that it's, at this point, it's also, because it's here, it's certainly irrelevant to my client. If this was Mr. Dulos's case, that would be a different story. As the court knows, we have charged Mr. Dulos with committing the crime of murder, and the defendant is charged with conspiring with him to commit that crime of murder. This is directly probative to that issue, whether or not a conspirator committed an overt act still here says in this trial. Well, first, the court addresses whether it is hearsay. It is hearsay. Now, the next question is whether or not there is an exception. And the court would indicate that under the code, well, first, the court is going to just make clear Generally, what is the purpose of the hearsay rule? The purpose of the hearsay rule is to keep out of evidence statements or assertions by a declarant that could be considered or would be considered untrustworthy or unreliable. That's the purpose of the hearsay rule. The code has carved out exceptions to the hearsay rule. One of those exceptions is essentially called the residual exception to the hearsay rule. And the residual exception to the hearsay rule requires that the hearsay have indicia of reliability. It doesn't fall within the named exceptions to the hearsay rule, but it stands essentially as somewhat of a catch-all. If there is indicia of reliability, the court may admit it. So, counsel, other than simply the charge, what uh, is the indicia of reliability? Well, Judge, respectfully, I disagree that this is being offered for a hearsay purpose. If I may proffer, 
the evidence is going to be that Mr. Doulos was asking whether or not a particular object. I'm going to object to him proffering and answering it when I've objected to the testimony in the first place. Well, well, the court's question is, what is the indicia of reliability? That presumes the court has found that this is hearsay. Counsel has stated it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. The court does not know what the content of the conversation was. Perhaps the jury needs to be excused. Yes, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to take up a legal question. Please do not discuss the case. Well, if the question is, what was that conversation? The court understands that question to mean the conversation in which Fotis Doulos was a participant. What did Fotis Doulos say? This is just an example. Well, he said he wanted to know where the cameras were at 69 Wells Lane or wherever Jennifer Doulos was living at the time. Is that offered for the truth of the matter asserted? Perhaps I can make an offer of proof to the witness. Yes. Mr. Gamini, I'm just going to ask these questions outside the presence of the jury so the judge can make a legal determination, okay? Can you tell Judge Randolph what Mr. Doulos said to Mr. Zeisler in your presence? Yes, he showed him pictures on his phone of Jennifer House, and he was asking him if this is camera, if this is camera, if this is camera. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. I believe he said no. And then did you at some point enter the conversation as well? Yes, I told him that I don't think those are cameras, but I told him, you know, if Jennifer wants to record you, she can purchase one of those small square cameras and place it anywhere. Just basically don't do anything stupid. And was he concerned about picking up the children? Was that his concern, if you recall? I don't recall. Okay. So that would pretty much be the offer, Judge. And if I may, you know, as I indicated, this is not being offered to prove the truth of any fact asserted. In fact, Mr. Doulos is asking questions. Mr. Zeisler is saying it's not a camera. I'm not offering that for the truth of the matter asserted. And then Mr. Gamini chimes in and says, well, she can record you with just about anything. Don't do anything stupid. None of that is being offered to prove a fact, except it's probative to the issue of was Mr. Doulos concerned that there were cameras at 69 Wells Lane, which, of course, is extremely probative for the jury to understand whether or not he was planning this crime. I think the evidence at this point, Judge, shows that this was a well thought out, executed crime in which a body has never been recovered, in which evidence was disposed of and discarded. So the fact that Mr. Doulos is asking about cameras in the month leading up to Jennifer Doulos' disappearance is relevant. It's not being offered for its truth. And the court, of course, can give a limiting instruction on the appropriate purpose to the jury to minimize any potential prejudice to the defense. But it's not hearsay because I'm not offering it for its truth. So then it just becomes a question of relevance. So the question the court has, Attorney McGinnis, is would not the question, what was Fotis Doulos concerned about, avoid a hearsay objection? So I actually think, and I mean this respectfully, Your Honor, I actually think that that would draw a hearsay objection. 
because then I apparently would be offering it to show what he was in fact concerned about. There could be a state of mind exception with respect to that. But I want to just ask him what Mr. Dulos was asking about. Certainly a question is not an assertion offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So our position is that this is a non-hearsay um, issue. It's just a question of basic relevance. And I think I've explained to the court why we believe that this is probative to the issue of uh, whether or not Mr. Dulos was planning on committing this offense. If I may respond brief, yeah. briefly. Okay. First of all, this was the subject of a motion in limine on January 10th. This goes to the issue of hearsay. Now, I don't disagree with part of what Mr. McGinnis just said. It is true they have to prove that under the way they charge this, that Fotis Dulos committed an intentional murder. That's, but this isn't Mr. Dulos's trial. It is Ms. Traconis's trial. Therefore, the rules of evidence don't go out the window just because Mr. Dulos is not on trial. If he was, this conversation would clearly come in. But the fact that it becomes more difficult for them to pursue, they don't get to prove against my client what was in Mr. Dulos's mind based on saying that we can go get past the hearsay exception and allow a jury to conclude that Mr. Dulos was concerned about the fact of cameras. And with all due respect to um, uh, Mr. Gumieni, who was not even present for the whole conversation, it's snippets, and then he opined, but he didn't know, and he made up, and he said, um, as I just heard the testimony, anything can be a camera. So that's the problem with what I hear Mr. McGinnis doing. He is essentially saying, well, we have to prove something against someone who's not on trial, so we get to do all these things without having to consider the fact that the person who it's against is not on trial. The rules of evidence would still apply in this trial. I don't get to cross-examine uh, the, uh, the uh, declarants, either Mr. I don't know about Mr. Zeisler, but certainly Mr. Dulos. So it's an, also a confrontation clause issue. How do I even address what was in someone else's mind when they're not here? So, well, Judge. before we proceed, the court sees this evidence this way. The court has already indicated it is hearsay. However, the court clearly sees an exception. The exception can fall into either, and the court uh, is not uh, electing this as the primary exception, the residual exception to the hearsay rule. But it's a statement by a co-conspirator in the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. It cannot be used to prove the conspiracy. It is a statement by a co-conspirator in the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now's the time then, because I filed a, both a motion and a memo. Under the law, the court has to make a separate finding that a conspiracy to commit a particular crime has been proven at this point. And that is the whole Counsel, point. How of can this. the court make a finding when the fact finder hasn't made a finding? The court must, under the law, make a finding that there is proof of a conspiracy before any of this is admissible under an exception, to, under that exception. The court the disagrees. I can bring the jury back in. You may proceed, Counsel. Yes, oh, Judge. Oh, first, would Counsel stipulate? Yes, sir. Yes, Judge. Thank you. 
Mr. Committee, where we left off, um, I don't remember my exact last question, but we were discussing whether or not Mr. Dulos had ever discussed cameras at Jennifer Dulos's residence. Do you recall that question? Yes. When did this discussion take place? I want to say a month or two before the May 24th of 2019. And where did this conversation take place? Up in the office, for group's office. I apologize if I've asked these questions already, but um, who was present for this conversation? Dan Zeisler. It's an audio video contractor. And um, do you recall whether or not you were present for the entirety of the conversation? I'm not sure if I if I was sitting at the desk and they walk in or or they were in the office and I walked in. I, um, but they were already talking. Yes. And what did you hear Mr. Dulo saying to Mr. Zeisler? Mr. Dulo pulled out his phone and and start showing uh, Dan Zeisler pictures of Jennifer um, Tom with uh, which I believe was um, motion detectors. <clears throat> And starts asking him if those are cameras. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. I think he said they are not. And did you participate in the conversation yes. at all? What did you say? I said, I don't think so. I don't think those are cameras. Did you say anything else to Mr. Dulos? Yes, I researched it. Um, I recently saw a commercial of like a small square cameras, inch by inch. I believe they were called cop camera. And I, I showed him that and I said, you know, um, she can record you with anything. Just don't do anything stupid when you go there. And when you say don't do anything stupid when you go there, what were you referring to when you said when you go there? I don't know, like w whenever he was worried about. Now, um, I want to direct your attention to the spring of 2019, around that same time. Did Mr. Dulos have any dogs? Yes. How many dogs did he have? At some point he had two dogs. There was a um, uh, light brown, I, I think it's called Lab. And then uh, I think Jennifer had like a little dog, like a Chihuahua or something like that. And did one of the dogs get ill? Yes. Which one? Um, the the lab, the big one. Was the uh, lab still living at Fort Jefferson Crossing at yes. that point? If you could just let me just finish the question before you answer, okay? Was the lab still living at Fort Jefferson Crossing at that point? Yes. And did you did you actually end up taking the lab to the veterinarian? Yes. Did Mr. Julius go with you or did you take it on your own? I took it on my own. And uh, did there come a point in time when you spoke with Mr. Julius about the dog's health? Yes. Approximately how long after you took the dog to the vet was that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Approximately how long after you took the dog to the veterinarian was that? I don't remember exactly. I want to say a day or two after. And... Um, what did you say to Mr. Dulos? I asked him how is Beckham doing. And was anyone else present for this conversation? Michelle. When you say Michelle, you're referring to the defendant, correct? Yes. Where did this conversation take place? I believe it was um, I walked out of uh, the office door in between the garages, and they were standing there. And what did Mr. Dulos say when you asked if? Beckham was... He said that Beckham is ill and he's going to have to put him to sleep. And um, he said something like, uh, can you believe that Jennifer won't even let the kids come over and say goodbye to, to the dog before we put him to sleep. Did you respond to that comment? I don't remember. And you indicated that the defendant was present. Did she say anything at that point? Yes. Tell the jury what the defendant said. 
She said um, the she should be buried right next to this dog. And when you say she, what exactly did she say? Um, can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bitch should be buried right next to this dog. And what was her uh, demeanor like when she said this? I I think she was um, trying to cheer, cheer Dulos up. He was like heartbroken that, that his dog is about to be put down. How did he react when she said this? I believe he, he just look at look at her. <clears throat> Now, in 2019, what type of vehicle did you own? Um, red Toyota Tacoma. How long had you owned that vehicle? I don't remember. I believe I bought the, bought the car in like 2012. And if it was, what year was it? 2001. So it was a used vehicle when you purchased it? Yes. What condition was it in when you purchased it? What do you mean by that? Well, was it, uh, I think everybody's probably bought a used car that wasn't in great condition. I mean, was it running? Was it? Yeah, it was, it was okay. And was this your only personal vehicle? Yes. Was it registered in your name or your wife's name? My wife's name. And would you use that vehicle for work-related things? Can you repeat the question? Would you use that vehicle for work-related things? Yes. Did you have any side jobs in 2019? Yes. What type of side job did you have? I would do like decks, small roofs, um, some siding repairs, windows replacement, things like that on the weekends. And with specifically with respect to the Tacoma, did you have any side jobs for which you used the Tacoma? Yes, snow blowing. And was your Tacoma modified in any way to account for the snowplow? Yes. Tell the jury how it was modified. I, um, I have a, um, uh, it's called snowplow mount. It's, it's basically a um, big metal piece underneath the front bumper that the snowplow attaches to. And would you leave that on the Tacoma even in yes. the winter months? Yes. Now, I want to turn back to Ford Group. What was your official title with Ford Group when you joined them in 2016? Project manager. And approximately how many projects would you say you would manage at any given time while working for Ford Group? Um, mostly one at a time, sometimes those two. Where did Ford Group own properties while you worked for them? Um, I'm not sure if we, Ford Jefferson was owned by Ford Group or it was, it was not. Um, but I know they own 585 Dirk Cliff, 80 Mountain Spring Road, and 61 Stillbridge Hill Road. How about 88 Mountain? 88 Mountain? Yes. And um, also, they had built the house at 77 Mountain Spring Road, is that correct? That's across the street from 80? Yes, sir. Yes. Were you a part of that build at all? No. How many project managers work for Ford Group? Over what time, Your Honor? Check. Uh, from your time working for Ford Group beginning in 2016 until 2019, did the number of project managers vary? Yes. And at any given time, how many project managers were there as a minimum? One. And so were you always a project manager for Ford Group? Between 2016 and 2019? Yes. Yes. And who, who were some of the other project managers during that time period? Um, Andy Loomis, Stefan Rage, Guillaume Bidelet, Matt Byrne. 
I think Lauren or Maddie I at some point. And would some of these project managers leave four group and come back and was, what was the dynamic like? Um, no, I think, I don't think anybody was leaving and coming back now. Okay, so if they left, they left. Yes. How did Mr. Dulos treat you as his employee? Okay, the thing with him was, you know, he was very um, hard-headed. He didn't like people. They say no to him. That's the easiest way to say. Well, did you enjoy working for Four Group? It was, yeah, it was a good job, good pay. Why did you like working there? I like to, I like to do that kind of stuff. When you say that kind of stuff, you mean manage projects? Building houses, manage projects. You indicated that Mr. Julos could be hard-headed. Did there come a point in time where you built your own house? Um, I renovated. And that's the house that you currently live in? Yes. And uh, did you ever have any discussions with Mr. Dulos about whether or not Four Group would be a part of that renovation? He offered me help, yes. Did you accept his help? No, I refused it. Why? Because I want my house to be done the way I wanted to get it done. <clears throat> I don't want him to say that you got to do things this way or that way, like he was very stubborn about things. Did you ever socialize with Mr. Julius outside of work? No. And I'm using socialize in the broadest terms. Did you ever attend Greek Easter at his house? Yes. How often? Um, I want to say I went there two or three times. Do you recall what years you went to Greek Easter at Mr. Julius' house? Could have been 2017, 18, and 19. Why did you go to Greek Easter? He was inviting everybody. Did your wife attend? Mm, I think once. Did you feel sorry for Mr. Dulos at any point? And that's why you attended Greek Easter? Objection. Relevance. Relevance, counsel. Well, the relevance, Judge, is that provides the reason why Mr. Gumeni went to Greek Easter in the first instance. It explains his presence, and I, if I may proffer, he's going to indicate that he went because Mr. Dulos' family was not present. Well, still not relevant. that question by itself is not relevant. The court is not foreclosing the avenue. It's the same. When you went to Greek Easter in 2019, were any of Mr. Dulos' children present? 2019? Yes, sir. No. Was Jennifer Dulos present? No. Did he ever tell you whether or not they would be present? I think he mentioned that to me, that, um, that Jennifer won't let the kids um, come to Easter because Michelle and her family is there. Now, what days of the week did you work at Four Group? Monday to Friday. What were your typical hours? Eight to five, but it wasn't set hours. I was basically given a project and, and you know, if, if I was there from nine to six or, or eight to five or seven to four, it, it it didn't matter. <clears throat> Mr. Julius wasn't clocking your time, in no. other words. Is that correct? That's correct. Were you a salaried employee? Yes. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Julius's priority was simply that the project be completed on time? Yes. So whether you worked 35 hours or 40 hours in a given week didn't yes. really matter to him. Is that fair to say? Correct. Now, you mentioned that you... Um, renovated a house in Simsbury. How many times did, well, firstly, let me ask it this way. Did Mr. Dulos ever go to your house? Yes. How many times? Twice. Did you consider Mr. Dulos to be a close friend? No. 
He was your boss. Yes. You mentioned your personal vehicle, the Toyota Tacoma. Did Ford Group own any vehicles in 2019? Yes. Tell the jury what vehicles Ford Group owned. It was white Jeep Cherokee, um, Chevy Suburban, and uh, Ford Raptor. And where would these vehicles be kept? At Ford Jefferson. Now, in terms of the vehicles themselves, specifically the Ford Group vehicles, when you would go to a job site, would you use your personal vehicle or would you use a Ford Group vehicle? Ford Group vehicle. And where would you get the Ford Group vehicle? At uh, Ford Jefferson. Working at Ford Group, when would you typically take possession of a Ford Group vehicle? Monday morning. And so if you take possession of a Ford Group vehicle on Monday morning, how long would you have it for? For the whole week until Friday afternoon. Why would you hang on to a, a Ford Group vehicle for the entire week? So I could leave straight from uh, Simsbury, from my house, to, uh, to the job site, to New Canaan, without, without stopping by the office. And you mentioned New Canaan. Was Ford Group working on a project in New Canaan in May of 2019? Yes. What project was that? 61 Sturbridge Hill. If you uh, took possession of a Ford Group vehicle for the entire week, where would you leave your vehicle? At Ford Group, at Ford Group office, Ford Jefferson. Would you use the same Ford Group vehicle each week? It, it varied sometimes. Tell the jury why it would vary. I like to drive the Jeep, and uh, and I believe Michelle would like to drive the Jeep, and, and Ford has wanted me to drive the Jeep because it was better on gas. And, and I guess he didn't want me to put that kind of mileage on the Ford Raptor, which was more expensive vehicle. But were there times where you would take the Raptor? Yes. What would be a situation in which you would take the, the Raptor for work? If I need some, need to move some bigger um, items that were delivered to Fort Jefferson, like toilets, vanities, stuff that wouldn't fit in the Jeep. And where would you leave your Tacoma key during the work week? Um, there was drawer in the kitchen or at my desk up, up in the office. Now you mentioned that you would drive straight to projects. Did you ever return to the Ford Group office during the week? Sometimes. Why would you go back to the Ford Group office during the week? Some paperwork invoices, um, basically to you know, touch bases with Dulas about project and things like that. If you return to the office during the week, would you take your Tacoma home or would you continue to take the Raptor or whatever vehicle you were using? I would continue to take whatever vehicle I was using. Now, in May of 2019, was your Tacoma experiencing any mechanical difficulties? Yes. Tell the jury what mechanical difficulties your vehicle was experiencing. Um, so the truck has... Uh, Trouble starting, um, was leaking oil, I believe, from power steering. Um, the check engine light that was on, it, it had multiple problems. Did Mr. Julos ever drive your Tacoma? Yes, he did. How do you know? Um, I would find like a Starbucks coffee cups in it, um, and and I was telling him not to drive it because the you know the car was having mechanical problems, and I was concerned that he's gonna get an accident or something. On your insurance, yes. Did Mr. Dulos ever call you about any mechanical issues with your Tacoma? Yes. When was that? I don't recall the exact day. I want to say about um, two weeks prior to May 24th. 
What did Mr. Julio say to you? He called me and, and he said that he can't start the truck. Um, how do you start it? What's wrong with it? And I told him it's the starter really. He asked me if it's the battery, if the battery is not good. I said, no, just keep turning the key. My start is the starter really. Did you express to him not to drive your vehicle at that point? Prior to that. So were you surprised when he was calling you asking you how to start the vehicle? Yeah, he wouldn't listen. He would drive it anyways. You mentioned earlier to the jury that your Tacoma was leaking oil in May of 2019? Yes. For approximately how long it had been leaking oil? I want to say I discovered it about a month earlier. Did you tell Mr. Dulos that the vehicle was leaking oil? Yes. Why did you tell him that? Because I don't want to stay in his driveway. And when you told Mr. Dulos that your vehicle was leaking oil, what, if anything, did he say back to you? He said, let's park it in the garage or on the grass area, it's fine, but let's park it in the garage. So at that point, he did not ask you not to park the car at Fort Jefferson Crossing, correct? No. You had mentioned that you were working on a project at 61 Sturbridge in New Canaan. Yes. What type of property was 61 Sturbridge? Residential. And what type of work was Ford Group doing at that location? Building a house. And when you say building a house, there was a house already there, is that correct? Yeah, that house, um, Ford Group demolished that old existing house <clears throat> and built, built new one. And were there any subcontractors working on that property as well? Meaning when? In May of 2019, were there any uh, <coughs> subcontractors that Ford Group was paying to do work at the house? Yes. <coughs> Tell the jury which subcontractors those were. Uh, I don't remember. I, there was a painter, um, gutter guy, I believe siding guy, um, landscaping guy. And what were your responsibilities with respect to that particular property? I was managing it. And how many days a week were you there? Most of the days. How long had you been managing the project for in May of 2019? Since the beginning. <clears throat> so probably for a year. And did you do any work on the property as well? Yes. What type of work would you do? Um, like installing mirrors, um, door hardware. <clears throat> I believe I cut down a big tree on, on front of the property. Um, that kind of stuff. Was, was that typical in your role as a project manager to do smaller jobs like that? No. Why are you doing it on this particular property? I like to spend time on the, uh, on the job site and just might as well being there. And do you remember approximately how many other projects Ford Group was working on in May of 2019? I believe that was the only one. There was some bidding on 88, but uh, the work hasn't begun yet. And was 61 Sturbridge the only project that you were working on at that point? Yes. Now, did there come a time when Mr. Dulos asked you to move your vehicle to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. Tell the jury how that happened. Um, I believe he called me. Um, I'm not sure about the date. Um, it was the day when uh, Stefan Rage and, and uh, his girlfriend came in for dinner. 
And um, he called me and, and asked me if I was coming down to the office and if we, if we could move uh, the Tacoma to 80 miles per minute. And I believe you indicated you can't recall the date, but you recall Stefan Reich and his girlfriend? Yes. Where were they present? When um, when I came back from 80 Mountain Spring Road with Dulos and their Raptor, <clears throat> and then I was pulling out of Fort Jeffers Crossing, I believe Stefan pulled in with his car and we, we talked for a minute. Now I want to talk to you about this for a second. You indicated that you came back from 80 Mountain Spring Road with the Raptor. Yes. Um, I want to direct your attention now to the week of May 20th, 2019, Monday, May 20th. Did you have the Raptor for that particular work week? You mean May 20th, the whole week? Yes. Yes. And do you recall when you picked up the Raptor? I believe it was like a uh, week prior to that. So May 13th? Yes. Why did you have the Raptor for two entire weeks? I don't remember. I think it had something to do with, uh, with moving uh, door slab from one of the contractors to, to 61 service. So would it be fair to say then that you had the Raptor over the weekend of the 18th and 19th? Or to the best of your recollection? Yes. Did Mr. Dulos tell you why he wanted the Tacoma move to 80 Mountain Spring Road? No. Was that the uh, first and only time you were ever asked to move the Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. Where did you meet up with Mr. Dulos to do this? I pulled into Fort Jefferson and the garage door was open and, and he was ready to, to leave. When you say he was ready to leave, where was he and where was your Tacoma? I believe my Tacoma was in the garage and I just pulled into the parking lot with the, with the doctor. And at some point, did he leave Fort Jefferson Crossing with the Tacoma? Yes, he just told me to follow him. And did you follow him? Yes. And did you follow him in the Raptor? Yes. Approximately how far away is 80 Mountain Spring Road from Fort Jefferson Crossing? I want to say five minute drive. Not terribly far. No. Did the two of you head straight to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. And did you drive one behind the other? I believe I was a little bit. Um, farther behind him. They took me some time to turn around or something. I don't know. Did you ever ask Mr. Julius why we're moving the Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road? No. Why not? I didn't. I thought it might be the, the he was upset the oil is leaking in his garage. I don't know. I didn't ask him. You indicated that you were following behind Mr. Dulos. Did you arrive at 80 Mountain Spring Road at approximately the same time that he did? Yes. And did you see him park your Tacoma? Yes. Can you describe for the jury how he parked the Tacoma? So he pulled in around the garage and um, turned the truck around like it's like he was ready to leave and park it on the side of the uh, driver, the parking spot. And when you say ready to leave, did he back so, it? So the, the, the front of the truck was facing... Outward? Yep. And after he parked the vehicle, what happened next? He got in a uh, Raptor and, and we drove back to Fort Jefferson. Now, did you ever... Uh, socialize with Mr. Dulos and the defendant, Michelle Traconis, at the same time? 
What do you mean by that? Let me uh, sharpen my question a little bit. Did you ever ride dirt bikes with the defendant, Mr. Dulos? Yes. Firstly, how long have you been riding dirt bikes for? Me personally, I I learned when I was a kid. So, 35 years. And how did it come to be that you ended up riding dirt bikes with the defendant and Mr. Dulos? Can you rephrase the question? How did you, uh, how did that gathering end up happening? Did they invite you or what happened? Yes. Um, one of the days, um, I believe the first time I went for a ride, it was um, just with Dulos. Where did the two of you ride? At the um, Power Lines Trail behind Fort Jefferson Crossing. For the beginners, it's probably a good time to take the morning recess. Ladies yes, and sir. gentlemen, we will stand in our morning recess until 11.35. Please do not discuss the case.
This Honorable Superior Court is now opening back in session. Please be seated. Thank you. Judge, before we proceed, uh, I've got to put something on the record because um, I'm a little concerned. Um, I had filed uh, back on January 10th. I filed a, uh, uh, a uh, memorandum with my motion in limine about the hearsay of uh, Mr. Doulos, an other alleged co-conspirator. And um, I cited cases such as State versus Vesicchio, V-E-S-S-I-C-H-I-O, which itself relies on a Second Circuit case going back to 1969, Guinea, United States versus Guinea. Um, it's a Second Circuit case. And I know Your Honor disagrees, but I thought it was settled law in Connecticut that in, before any co-conspirator hearsay, alleged co-conspirator statements hearsay comes in under the exception, the court was required to make, to make specific up findings that are based on things besides the statements. In other words, the court excludes the statements and then determines whether or not there is a, um, a finding by a preponderance of the evidence, and the court must actually make that finding, uh, that there is a, a preponderance of the evidence independent of the hearsay, that the court must decide that first that a conspiracy existed, that the declarant and the defendant were participate, participants in the conspiracy, and that the statement was made in furtherance of the conspiracy. And I submit that so far that none of those things have been shown. The court has disagreed, but I need to put that on the record because, you know, if this has been the law of Connecticut since I think I started practicing, um, and the court is disagreeing, again, I, I don't know what to do other than, again, to move for a mistrial because I, I just don't know what to do. Well, counsel. You've been in practice for many years. If the court were to determine there was a conspiracy, how could you argue at the time the state rested its case for a motion for judgment of acquittal when the court has already found a conspiracy? Well, that's, that's a good point. But first, it's by a fair preponderance of the evidence, which is, of course, a lower standard, number one. Um, number two, um, that presumes that, uh, that that precludes a motion for judgment of acquittal, which, of course, I would then be making as well at the conclusion of the state's case. This is just a preliminary at a lower threshold. And again, that's only determining that there's a conspiracy as to, we don't, I'm not even arguing it, we don't even know which crime. I'm only assuming, based on the evidence, that it would be a conspiracy to commit uh, murder would be the only charge. At this point, it would have to, maybe the state has more evidence. But at this point, the court would have to make that determination. And I understand what Your Honor is saying. I thought what the court said is it's up to the jury, and that's not my understanding of the law. And that's why I feel I have to make that motion, because you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a, a, I could teach evidence, because I don't know if I'd be qualified to do that. But I believe I know the rules well enough to at least be able to raise the issue and preserve the record. And that's my concern, you know, because when it comes to something like this, hearsay also has a constitutional uh, 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 imprimatur when it comes to issues of, I can't cross-examine a deceased person. I can't cross-examine people who aren't even in the room. And, you know, I, I'm doing it to protect the record, so I just want the court to understand the reason that I feel I have to do that. Thank you. Does the state wish to respond? Judge, just that, uh, again, I wasn't offering it for a hearsay purpose. That's our position legally. Um, and I think, frankly, you know, the defense's objection with respect to the confrontation clause is not well taken at all. Um, because number one, um, if we're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted, but merely to show that Mr. Dulos was concerned about the cameras, it's not testimonial in nature, and therefore the confrontation clause is not implicated in the first instance. But uh, even assuming we were offering it for its truth, which we're not, um, there's certainly no evidence that uh, the declarant, Mr. Dulos, made this statement in anticipation of any criminal proceedings. So quite frankly, I think the confrontation clause argument is uh, severely 
misplaced, Judge, and I'd ask that the court uh, deny the defense's motion for mistrial. I've never experienced so many motions for a mistrial over evidentiary issues. Um, I, I'm not sure why the defense keeps moving for mistrials on evidentiary issues, Judge, but I would just ask that the court once again deny their request for a mistrial. Their objections are not well taken. Thank you. The motion for a mistrial is denied. We can bring the jury back in. I would just note, without my having a object, standing objection to the hearsay, then, without my having to jump up and interrupt, if the court would at least allow that to proceed in that fashion. Well, well before we bring the jury out, the court noticed that uh, counsel did not object to certain other statements uh, that were allegedly made by Fotis Dulos. And uh, essentially, the court had to consider whether those statements were made during the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. From what the court has heard so far, from all of the hearsay that has been admitted, some of those statements were not in the course of in furtherance of the conspiracy. However, counsel did not object. Some of them might have been admitted for a reason that I, if I objected, I knew that Mr. McGinnis would have a response, especially questions. I always believe that if somebody asks something that's not your sake, it's not a statement. So if I ask what time is it, that's not a statement of the time, that's just an inquiry. So there were times when, and, and there may be other reasons that if it's, if it's unimportant, I don't want to interrupt because there's also reasons not to object to everything that might be used. Well, that's interesting, Judge, because earlier when I was examining Mr. Gumini, and Mr. Dulos asked the question, is this cameras? The defense objected on grounds of hearsay. So I guess within the last 10 minutes, they've changed their position with respect to whether or not a question constitutes hearsay. I object to any sort of continuous objection, Your Honor, because as the defense aptly pointed out, this is an area where we agree. Not every statement that I'm offering is for the truth of the matter asserted. In fact, much of what Mr. Dulo said is not being Your offered. Honor, for the Much of what Mr. Dulos is alleged to have said in this case is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So it need not meet any hearsay exceptions. So I think if counsel has an objection to specific things, then he should raise them at the time. So the state, so the record is very clear, has an opportunity to respond and indicate what the purpose of the offer is. Well, Your Honor, that's absurd because there's speaking objections that are being allowed where the, where the state is being uh, narrating what they're going to get in regardless of the court's ruling. It's on this issue of things that Mr. Dulos said that I'm asking for a continuing objection. If the record were later show that some of these statements would have been admissible under other exceptions, that's for a different court, not for this court. But for me to have to object every time that uh, hearsay is being elicited through this witness, and I'm assuming that's going to go on for the rest of his testimony, that's my concern. Well, Judge, in this court's view, a continuing objection puts the burden on the court to determine what should be objected to. The court does not carry that role. If there are objections to be made, counsel is obligated to make them. The court is not going to carry that burden that counsel can ably carry. Do you wish to be heard, counsel? No, Judge. You can bring the jury in.
Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Mr. Committee, good morning again. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Gamini, I wanted to just go back to your 2001 Toyota Tacoma for a moment. In 2019, were the original Tacoma seats in the Tacoma? No. What types of seats were in the Tacoma in May of 2019? I believe uh, Ford Focus. Were those Ford Focus seats in the vehicle when you purchased it? No. Who put the Ford Focus seats in the vehicle? I did. Why? When I bought the car, I bought it from a uh, mechanic and they were just dirty red. And I decided to change them. And do you recall where you purchased the seats? It was a uh, mechanic in, in your brain. I, I don't remember. I believe it was the same one I got the uh, <coughs> Jennifer um, Range Rover. I believe where we left off prior to the break, you indicated that you had motorbiked or dirt biked with the defendant and Mr. Dulos. Is that correct? Yes. How many times did you do that? Once just with Dulos and once with Dulos and Michelle. And I believe you referred to an area as the power lines. Yes. Where is that area? So. Um, back of left, back left corner of Fort Jefferson, there was like a um, small trail that that, will, that was connecting to it. And how large was the trail? Miles. Can you describe the trail for the jury? It's a white gravel road made for. Um, um, Power line company, big trucks. And approximately when did you dirt bike with the defendant, Mr. Dulos? I can't remember. They had to be. I don't know, two weeks, few few weeks before that, few maybe month. And I want to just be clear when you say before that, what are you before thinking? May twenty fourth of twenty nineteen? Incidentally, did you own a dirt bike when you came to America? No. When did you get a dirt bike? I purchased that dirt bike uh, from Michelle Tsukonis a um, year or two prior to 2019. What type of dirt bike was it? It was um, Honda 250L, I believe. How long did the three of you dirt bike for? A few hours. Was it fun? Yeah. And was this the only time that you had sort of seen shelter come outside of a formal work event? Uh, I saw her at the um, Easter party. And like the hobby awards, but that I guess that's considered work. What are the hobby awards? There was um, meetings with all the builders that would get awarded for best project. You know. What year was this? It was happening every year. And was Four Group invited every year? Yes. And was there a year that Four Group actually got an award? Pretty much every time. And would you attend? Yes. Who else would attend? Whoever was managing it. Right, object to the vagueness. There's no time frame over the years. Well, it would happen every year with the testimony. The witness that he worked for the four group for a certain number of years. And the question, the court assumes is that you go every year that's what the court would assume the, the logical question would be to respond to counsel's concern well 
why don't we talk about 2019? First of all, when were the Hubby Awards typically held? When? Yeah, what month? I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall whether or not there was a Hubby Awards in 2019? I don't recall that, no. Okay. How about 2018? Yeah. And who attended in 2018, if you recall? It was me, um, Andy Loomis, Michelle Chocones, and Flores Dulos. Now, Andy Loomis, would he have been, I guess, your counterpart on another project? He was managing um, 80 Mountain Spring Road and 77 Mountain Spring Road. That was his project. In May of 2019, what were the status of 80 Mountain Spring Road and 77 Mountain Spring Road? They were finished. And when a project is finished, what happens then? It's on the market, waiting for potential buyer. And were there any realtors that Floor Group would work with usually? Yes. Um, one of them was Stefan Rich. And there was a few other ones that came and go, but I don't remember the names. Were there open houses at the projects? Yes, every now and then. And would you ever attend? Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned that you had purchased a dirt bike from the defendant. Where would you typically keep the dirt bike? Um, typically it would be on my house. And so if you kept the dirt bike at your house, where would you normally ride it? I just play around with my son a little bit on, on the backyard. Do you recall um, whether or not Mr. Dulos and the defendant invited you to dirt bike with them? Yes. Incidentally, how long had Mr. Dulos been dirt biking? He he was not an experienced uh, rider. I, I think um, he purchased his first dirt bike right after he met Michelle. Oh, right after Michelle moved into. Or, or maybe before she moved in, or around that time. After you rode uh, dirt bikes with Mr. Dulos and the defendant, what did you do with your dirt bike? I left it at Fort Jefferson Crossing in the garage. Why did you leave the dirt bike at Fort Jefferson Crossing? It was, I was exhausted and, and just want to go home. So he says like, yeah, just leave it here. Do you remember what day of the week this was? Was it your intention to return to Fort Jefferson Crossing and take your dirt bike back to your house? When? On May 24, 2019? Yes. Did you ever tell Mr. Doulos that that's what you were planning on doing? Yes. When did you tell him this? When, uh, when we moved Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road and when I was giving him ride back, um, I told him if he's going to be there Friday evening and give me a ride back so I can get my truck back and then I can take my dirt bike. Did you have any conversation that day with Mr. Dulos about what he would be doing on May 24, 2019? I believe he told me... Um, Objection, you're saying and again, not applicable to my client. I am definitely not offering this for the truth, Judge. So it is not hearsay. Well, ask the question so that the court can determine whether it is What did Mr. Dulos tell you about where he would be on May 24th, 2019? Sounds like hearsay and relevance to my client. Well, what did Mr. Dulos tell you about where he would be? The response is, of course, going to come from the mouth of the declarant. And if it is here, say the court will have it stricken if it's offered for the truth. And I am not offering this for its truth, just to be very clear about this. So it's not being offered for a hearsay purpose. 
So at this point, the objection is overruled. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Julius about where he would be on May 24, 2019 in the morning hours? Yes. What did he tell you about where he would be in the morning hours on May 24, 2019? He told me um, not to stop by the office on my way to New Canaan um, between 7 and 9 o'clock because he's going to have a meeting with uh, his divorce lawyer. <clears throat> And would Mr. Dulos occasionally meet with attorneys at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. And were you present at times when an attorney would come to visit with Mr. Dulos? He would always tell me to go get lunch, go check on 80 Mountain Spring Road. He did not want me to be present. And, and... Was this the first time, however, that Mr. Dulos gave you advance notice that an attorney would be coming to the office? I believe so, yes. Would you routinely go to the office in the morning? No. Every Monday. Every Monday, you said? Yes. Now, we've spoken about dirt bikes. I want to talk to you now about bicycles. Did Mr. Julos own any bicycles? Yes. And was there uh, a bicycle that Mr. Dulos owned that appeared to be older? Yes. What type of bicycle is this? He told me that's, uh, that's his childhood bicycle. It was, um, I don't remember the name of it. It was French made. I'm going to object to this as hearsay. It had nothing to do with my client. It's well, not in further incident. Well, first, well, we'll hear from counsel first. Judge, again, I'm not offering this to prove it was, in fact, his childhood bicycle. He's indicating that this is a particular bicycle and attributing certain um, uh, facts to it. But I'm not offering those facts for the truth. It explains the description of the bicycle, which I'm about to ask. He can ask about the description. I don't think whatever Mr. Dulos may or may not said about it, whether it's worth a million dollars or worth a dollar matters. Well, uh, the response was, or began this way, uh, Fortis Dulo said, well, previous to that response, what kind of bicycle was it? Was it an older bicycle? Yes. And so, counsel, you may continue the line. Uh, did, did you ever see this bicycle? Yes. Describe it for the jury. It was an uh, older French-made bicycle, dark color, um, I want to say either brown or, or black, with like a, like a racing bicycle with the horns. All right. Where did Mr. Julos keep this bicycle? In, in the garage in Fort Jefferson. Where would he keep it in the garage? I believe it was hanging on one of those hooks in, in, in his garage. When you say hanging on a hook, where was the hook located? There were like heavy duty hooks made for bicycles on the, attached to the garage walls. I want to direct your attention now to Friday, May 24th. 2019. That was the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, is that correct? Yes. Incidentally, does your wife um, celebrate a birthday around that time? Yes. When's your wife's birthday? May told you. When you began your day that morning, where were you? I was home. And can you just refresh the jury's memory as to where you live? 27 Springbrook, Sinsburg. What vehicle did you have when you began your day? Ford Raptor. When you left that morning, did you take your cellular phone with you? Yes. What was your cellular phone number at the time? 
860-716-7363. You mentioned that you had the Raptor. For how long had you had that vehicle? Almost, almost two weeks. In 2019, were you aware that the Raptor had what's known as an infotainment system? What do you mean by that? Well, are, do you know what an infotainment system is? No. Did the Raptor have the ability to hook up to Bluetooth speaker with your cell phone and things oh, of that nature? Yes. Did you know that that infotainment system tracked the GPS of the Raptor? I didn't. When you left your home in Simsbury that morning, where did you go? To straight to the job site in New Canaan. And the job site was located at 61 Sturbridge? Yes. Is it Sturbridge Hill? I believe Sturbridge Hill Road. On your way to 61 Sturbridge Hill Road, did you speak to anyone? Yes. On your cellular phone? Yes. Who did you speak to? Um, my and my wife's friend, Anna. Approximately how long did you speak with her for? About 20, 25 minutes. And without getting into too much of that conversation, it was about whether or not Anna was going to be attending your wife's birthday party, which was scheduled for the next day, correct? Yes. When you arrived at 61 Sturbridge, was anyone else at the location? I don't remember. Can you tell us whether or not you met up with any sub subcontractors at 61 Sturbridge that day? I, I don't remember if, if I meet with anybody at that job site. It, there's possibility that I, I met with- I would with object to speculation of what's possible. He's expanding on his answer. Well, his response was, I don't remember if I met anyone, any subcontractor that day. And then the next sentence was, there's a possibility. Well, the question had been responded to. You may ask another question. Mr. Gumini, May 24th, 2019 was, at the time, just another day of work for you. Is that correct? Yes. It was Friday before a long weekend. And so because of that, have you occasionally had difficulty remembering exactly what you did on May 24th, 2019? Yes. You didn't know someday you'd be in court talking about Objection, it. leading an argument. Yes. Well, it's not leading. It's not argumentative. The question is, essentially, has your memory uh, been intact about that day? That's the question. Overruled. You didn't know someday you'd be in court talking about your whereabouts on May 24, no. 2019, correct? I did. And you never wrote a timeline about where you were on May 24. Objection no. leading. Well, it is a corollary to the previous question. You cannot remember. A logical corollary is, and you did not memorialize it correctly. <clears throat> you never wrote a timeline about where you were on May 24, 2019, correct? Never. At the um, stage of the project that 61 Sturbridge was in at the time, what kind of work was being done at the house, if you recall? I believe the painter was finishing painting, um, the landscaping guys were doing seeding grass and, and lens, installing plantings and things like that. Um, I was installing hardware for doors, mirrors. It was basically done. Approximately how long were you at 61 Sturbridge for? I believe I arrived around 10 o'clock. And I left 
I want to say 2.30. Did you ever meet up or see Mr. Dulos while you were in New Canaan? No. Incidentally, have you ever been to Jennifer Dulos' home in New Canaan at 69 Wells Lane? No. Did you speak with Mr. Dulos on the morning of May 24th? No. Did there come a point in time where you communicated with Mr. Dulos? Yes. Tell the jury about that communication. I believe at some point I sent him a um, text message with uh, invoice. Um, I don't remember the conversation. He 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 responded to me and he asked me what time I'm going to be back in Farmington. And I responded that it's going to be around 4.30, end of the day. And did he also ask you whether any progress had been made? Yes. Did you reply to that? I don't remember. What was the invoice for? For um, landscape. When you say for landscaping, was there landscaping work being done at 61 Sturbridge? Yes. Who was the landscaper, if you recall? Bill Woods. Approximately what time was this exchange? Uh, I can't recall it. it. It had to be after, after lunch hours. Did you ever um, leave 61 Sturbridge that day? It's possible that I went for lunch. Who would you have gone for lunch with? Well, again, it, he only indicates possible, so then the next question would clearly not be, who would you go with if, it's, if he doesn't know if he did? I'll rephrase it. You don't have a recollection as to whether or not you went for lunch, correct? I don't. Did you go for lunch uh, ever when you were working in New Canaan? Yes. Who did you go to lunch with? Um, Sydney Piano, the painting. <clears throat> Where did you go? Um, there's a Chinese restaurant <clears throat> down the road um, in New Canaan. And you don't recall whether or not it was on May 24th or a different day, correct? It's possible. After you left 61 Sturbridge, where did you go? I went back to Farmington. What vehicle were you driving? Ford Raptor. <clears throat> did you stop anywhere on the way? I believe I stopped by um, gas station across from Yukon <clears throat> in Farmington to fill up the Raptor. Okay. You've obviously driven the Tacoma and the Raptor for a few years, is that correct? Up until this point? Yeah. Did the Raptor take more gas than the Tacoma? Yes, he did. Do you recall approximately how much more gas? Um, I believe Tacoma won't take more than 17 gallons of gas on empty. Um, and the Raptor Definitely more, but I don't know how much, how much more. It has a bigger gas tank. <clears throat> Did you fill the gas tank of the Raptor? Yes. Did you get a receipt? Yes. Did you hang on to that receipt? Yes. Can you tell the jury why you hung on to that receipt? I was using a company credit card, and every end of the month I would... Um, if my boss do us um, the receipts. <clears throat> so you paid for the gas with a company credit card? Yes. Where was this gas station located? I don't remember the address. It's, I believe it's Babu Gas Station or something like that. It's uh, across the street from Yukon. Yukon? Yes. In what town? Farming. 
<clears throat> After you got yes, where did you go next? Fort Jefferson. Approximately what time did you arrive at Fort Jefferson? I want to say around 4.30, 4 4.40, around that time. Later on in the afternoon? Yes. And when you arrived at Fort Jefferson, can you indicate to the jury where you went? Actually, let me, let me ask it this way. Where, did, where, if anywhere, did you park the Raptor when you arrived at Fort Jefferson? I must have just pulled straight in between the garages into the parking area. And after you pulled straight in, did you see Mr. Dulos? No. Did you see the defendant? No. Did you see any vehicles? No. Did it appear that anyone was home? No. What did you do next? I went, um, I called Dulos to see where he is because we had an understanding that he's going to help me get my truck that evening. He didn't answer, so I went um, into the kitchen where I would usually leave the key for Tacoma to see if the key is there. Um, and I saw black iPhone on the island connected and charging, so I, I thought he might forgot his phone or something. And I went upstairs to the office to look at my desk and, and his desk if he didn't leave the key for, for the truck. Um, there, and, then, and I didn't see him. You mentioned earlier that it was your intention to get your dirt bike on this particular day. Is that correct? Yes. Was that another reason why you wanted the key to the Tacoma? Yes. Can you explain to the jury why you wanted the, t the key to the Tacoma so that you can bring your dirt bike home? The Tacoma had a longer bed than the Ford Raptor. Um, the Tacoma had a six-foot bed. Um, and Raptor was only five feet, so I don't think the dirt bike would fit in the, in the Raptor. And also, Tacoma being small truck was lower, which makes it easier to load the dirt bike on it. Did you locate your key in either the kitchen or the office? No. Incidentally, how were you able to access Fort Jefferson Crossing if no one was home? I have a key <clears throat> for the office and the house. Approximately how long did you have that key for? Probably since 2016. After you weren't able to locate your keys and Mr. Dulos didn't answer his phone, what did you do next? I um, I took the Raptor and I went to 585 Deer Cliff. And 585 Deer Cliff is located approximately how far away from Fort Jefferson Crossing? It's like a um, minute away. Now you listed off several properties earlier that Floor Group owned. Was 585 Deer Cliff Road one of them? Yes. Can you describe to the jury the condition of 585 Deer Cliff on May 24th, 2019? It was an uh, old house. There was um, on the market, I believe, as property only. I think the house was going to be demolished. And why did you go to 585 Deer Cliff? I wanted to grab um, 2 by 10 basically like a ramp to help me load the door bike. How did you know that there would be a 2x10 at 585 Deer Cliff? This is where I unload my door bike. I'm and sorry, that's what you said, sir. This is where I unload the door bike when I brought back to Fort Jefferson. Was it your 2x10? I don't know. Could it be one from job site? Could it be one of mine? Where was the 2x10 stored at 585? In the garage. Was there anything else in the garage? Yeah. What else was in the garage? Garage, Porsche Cayenne, some um, big exterior doors, and leftover materials from job sites. 
was 585 almost uh, becoming a storage location for the core group at this the point? The garage was, yes. Who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? I believe it belonged Objection, to... Objection, speculation, and here's something. Well, who owned the Porsche Cayenne? The court did not hear what came after that, Do, if you know it. That's what the court thought it heard. He said, I believe. Well, the question, who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? Was that the question, or was that not the question? That was the question, sir. Overruled. You may answer the question, Mr. Gilead. Can you repeat it, please? Who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? I believe it was registered on Jennifer Dulos. And you described it as crushed. What did you mean by that? It looks like someone hit a tree with it. Was the uh, Porsche Cayenne functioning at the time? No. Approximately how long were you at 585 Deercliff at, at, during this particular trip? Um, a minute. Was the garage door open or did you need a key? It, it wasn't locked. It just left it up and open. If it was your intention to take the Tacoma home that weekend, why did you load the 2 by 10 into the Raptor? First, I thought I was going to um, try to load the door bike on the Raptor. But as was I, I was pulling out of um, 585, I thought maybe I'll stop by 80 Mountain Spring Road and see if the key is in the truck or maybe Dulos is there. Or... <laughs> and you mentioned that the, you wanted to see if the key was in the truck. That was where you had gone with Mr. Dulos to park the Tacoma earlier in the week, is that right? Yeah. Was Mr. Dulos at 585 during this trip? Yes. 585? Oh, no. I'm sorry. No. Was the defendant at 585? No. Approximately how long did it take you to travel from 585 Deercliff to 80 Mountain Spring Road? I want to say about seven minutes. Five. Fairly quick ride? Yeah. When you arrived at 80 Mountain Spring Road, where did you go? I pulled right next to my truck. Can you just describe 80 Mountain Spring Road for the jury in terms of the driveway and its relationship to the house? So it's a it's a pretty long wavy driver. He comes in and then goes around the back of the house. And where was your Tacoma parked? Exactly the way we left it the day before. Now, 80 Mountain Spring Road has a four bay garage. Is that correct? Yes. Was the Tacoma parked in front of one of the garages? Or bays, I should say? Um, no, it was it was not close to the garage. It was away from the garage. Were there any other vehicles present when you arrived? Yes. What other vehicles were present? Um, by Jeep and um, Chevy Suburban. Was Mr. Dulos present? Yes. Was the defendant present? Yes. How did Mr. Dulos react when he saw you? The way I can say it, uh, look, like surprised for a second or two. How did the defendant react when she saw you? About the same way. Where were they located? So Dulos was standing um, next to the suburban, I believe, um, by the first bay, and Michelle was way back where the Jeep was, like, I want to say 15 feet away. 
And just to be clear here, when we're referring to the Jeep, we're referring to the white Jeep Cherokee, correct? Yes. And we're referring to the Suburban, we're referring to the black Suburban, correct? Yes. Did the black Suburban have anything on its roof? Yeah. What did it have on its it, roof? It's like a, it's like a trunk. It's, I guess it's called Tootle. Did you get out of your vehicle? Yes, I did. Well, not your vehicle, out of the Raptor, I guess. And did you say anything to Mr. Dulos? Yeah, I made a comment about his hair. And when you say you made a comment about his hair, describe his hair for the jury. He was closely shaped. In 2019, how were you wearing your hair? Exactly the same way. So what did you say to Mr. Dulos about his hair? I, I told him, um, what are you doing? You, sh you, you shave your head. Um, you wear, we wearing dirty or work clothes. You, you're trying to be as handsome as me. And how did Mr. Dulos respond? I think he just smiled. Did you ask Mr. Dulos what they were doing at 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He told me they were cleaning. Um, Michelle was, he told me Michelle was cleaning the windows and he was cleaning some you stuff outside. Said. Overruled. You can continue. He told me Michelle was cleaning the windows and he was cleaning some stuff outside. How long had you known the defendant at this point? Um, Approximately. About two or three years. And isn't it true that in all those years you never saw her cleaning a project site? I never, I don't recall it. Did you see any garbage bags? No. Did you see any cleaning supplies? No. Did you ever look inside either the Suburban or the Cherokee? No. At that time, referring to your first interaction with Mr. Dulos, do you recall the defendant saying anything? I don't know. You mentioned that Mr. Dulos and the defendant initially appeared surprised to see you. Can you describe their demeanor eventually as you continue to interact with them? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. You mentioned that they initially appeared surprised to see you, correct? Yes. Did the interaction ever change? Did, did it become more normal? Yes, after I made the joke. <laughs> and were they both acting normal at that point? Yes. What did you do next? I think I made a comment about the grass that I seeded there a few weeks prior to that. So you had done some work at 80 Mountain Spring Road? Okay, yes. Why did you seed the grass? Do what I was asking me to. And was the grass sort of cornered off at all? Roped off, I guess? No, I guess when they originally seeded it, um, it didn't take off well, so I had to reseed it. What was Mr. Dulos wearing at 80 Mountain? He was wearing um, light blue jeans with holes in it um, and brown shoes. I don't remember the t-shirt. Do you recall what type of clothing the defendant was wearing? I believe she was in black leggings kind of pants. You mentioned the grass. Um, did you and Mr. Dulos walk around the property of 80 Mountain? Yes. Can you describe for the jury what direction you went? We went around the front of the house and the back of the house, and we came back to the to the um, to the parking.
Did the two of you speak about the grass at that point? Yes. And what did Mr. Dulo say to you about the grass? I told him the grass looks really good. It took off. He's like, yeah, um, you know, I think we're going to sell the house, you know. And um, it's when we went around the back patio, there was like two trucks, I want to say, tire marks when the landscaping guy was doing some work there. He left. As you were walking around the property with Mr. Dulos, where was the defendant? Uh, Michelle stayed on the, on the parking spot. Approximately how long did you walk around the property with Mr. Dulos? I don't know how long does it take to walk around the house. Two minutes? Three? After you walked around the house, where did you go next? We all were standing by the first bay of the garage. Approximately how close to Mr. Dulos were you at this point? We were all next to each other. And if you could just maybe, just for the record, I mean, are we talking a couple of feet? Yes. And how far away were you from the defendant at this point? About the same distance as from Dulos, within two or three feet. And did you have a discussion with Mr. Dulos in the defendant's presence at that time? Yes. What was the discussion about? I told Dulos to, if he could give me right um, or ride with me to, to Fort Jefferson so we can leave one of the vehicles and he can give me right back so I can get my Tacoma. Because there was four cars and three people. And was the defendant present for this conversation? Yes. Did the defendant say anything during this conversation about where she was going to be going? Yeah, after Dulles told me, yeah, let's let's uh, let's go, and then um, and I believe Michelle said that she has to go meet with some somebody about some rugs, carpets. I think that's what I can remember. What happened next? I got in a Raptor, um, and then. I put the truck in reverse and I look on a Tacoma and I saw the uh, the key for my truck sticking from the passenger room. So I just want to be uh, clear about this. When you say sticking from your passenger door, was it in the slot for the key? Yes. Did you retrieve your Tacoma key at that point? No, because I figured I'll be back there in five, ten minutes. Okay. So what vehicle are you driving at this point? Ford Raptor. Did you, Mr. Dulos, and the defendant all leave 80 Mountain at the same time? I left. I didn't see him in the mirror, but um, shortly after I met with Dulos at Ford Jefferson. you know what vehicle Mr. Dulos was driving at that point? I believe um, the Chevy's Suburban. And what vehicle was the defendant driving? Um, the white Jeep. You indicated that you left. When you left 80 Mountain Spring Road, if you're coming out of the driveway, did you make a right or a left? I don't recall if I was backing out of the driveway or I turned around on the driveway, but I would take a right towards Fort Jefferson. And where did you go next? I went to 585 Dupree. And this is the home that has the Porsche Cayenne? Yes. Why did you go back to 585? I want to leave uh, the two by 10 there and, and my toolbox. How long did it take you to get from 80 Mountain Spring Road to 585? Five, seven minutes. 
Did the defendant or Mr. Dulos follow you to 585 in either of their vehicles? No. What did you do once you got back to 585? I unloaded the 2 by 10 and my toolbox, and then um, I went to Ford Jefferson Cross. Approximately how long were you at 585 during this trip? A minute. You indicated that you went back to Fort Jefferson Crossing. How long did it take you to get there? Another minute. Is, is 585 Deercliff closer to Fort Jefferson Crossing than 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. When you arrived at Fort Jefferson Crossing, what did you see? I saw um, I saw the black suburban park in the um, in the left bay in the garage. Did you see Mr. Dulos? Yes. Did you see the defendant? No. Did you see the white Cherokee? No. Can you tell us whether or not the white Cherokee was on the property at that time? I don't remember seeing it. And with respect to Mr. Dulos, what did he do when you arrived back at Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe he was doing something with his phone, either on the uh, mudroom entry or in the kitchen. Can't remember exactly. And what happened next? Um, he got into the Raptor and we went back to 80 Mountain Spring Road. And what was the purpose of going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road? To get out my truck. Do you recall at this point whether or not you were driving the Raptor or was Mr. Dumos? I don't. And approximately how long did it take you to get back to 80 Mountain Spring Road? It was about the same distance as um, 585 from 80 Mountain Spring Road, so it's five, seven minutes. When you arrived back at 80 Mountain Spring Road, was anyone present on the property besides you and Mr. Dulos initially? No. Did you see your Tacoma? Yes. Were the keys still in the passenger door of your Tacoma? No. Did you see your keys anywhere on the property at that point? No. Did you speak to Mr. Dulos about the fact that the keys were missing? Yes. What did Mr. Dulos say to you? He says that Michel has a key. So he knew that she had the keys? That's what he told me now. Did he say anything else to you at that point? Yes, he asked me if I wanted to just keep the Raptor um, for the weekend and, and leave the Tacoma at 80. Did you want to keep the Raptor? No. Why not? I didn't know if I'm going to fit the door back on, on a Raptor and I wanted to take the door back home. So you were willing to try it earlier, but now that you had access to your Tacoma, you wanted your Tacoma back. Is that yes. correct? Did you know that the defendant was going to be taking your keys? No. Did you tell her while you were all present at 80 Mountain Spring Road that she had permission to take your keys? No. Did she ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. Did Mr. Dulos ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. After you indicated to Mr. Dulos that you wanted your Tacoma, what happened next? I believe he called Michelle. And was that done in your presence? Yes. And did he indicate to you whether or not she would be coming back with your keys? I don't remember.
at some point, did the defendant arrive at 80 Mountain Spring Road with your keys? Yes. As you sit here, do you recall what vehicle she was driving when she arrived? No. In between the time that you believe Mr. Dulos called the defendant when she arrived with your keys, what were you and Mr. Dulos doing, if you recall? I don't recall. We, we, we could have um, walked down the property, um, fixing the ribbons, you know, by, by the driveway, something like that. I can't remember if I asked you this, but how long did it take for the defendant to arrive? I want to say between five and ten minutes. Who actually gave your keys back to you? Dulos. And after he gave you the keys, did the three of you leave again? Yes. Which vehicles are everyone driving at this point, if you recall? I don't know what Michelle was driving. Um, I know Dulos was taking the Raptor that we came in. I'm sorry, I missed that. I know Dulos was driving the Raptor because we came with the Raptor and I was taking my Tacoma. When you got in the Tacoma, did anything seem out of place in your vehicle? I don't recall it, no. Did you see anything that appeared to be blood in the vehicle? No. Did... Where did you go after leaving 80 Mountain Spring Road? I went to 585 Dirkwood. Did anyone follow you to 585 for this Dulos trip? Dulos did. Why did he follow you to 585? I was going to leave my Tacoma at 585 Dirkcliff and uh, he needed to give me a ride back to Fort Jefferson. And why were you going back to Fort Jefferson? To get to Dubai. How were you planning on getting the dirt bike to 585? I just drove it. Did the defendant go back to 585 with you and Mr. Dulos? No. When you got back to um, strike that. Did you and Mr. Dulos travel back to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Approximately how long did that take? From? From 585. A minute. And when you got to Fort Jefferson Crossing, what did you do? I, um, I was having trouble starting the door bike, so I had to use the battery booster to start it. I was playing around with that for a little bit. Did Mr. Dulos help you with the dirt bike? Yes. How did he help you? He gave me the battery booster and like basically stand next to me. On all of these trips, um, including when you were with Mr. Dulos and the Raptor and when he was assisting you at Fort Jefferson Crossing with the dirt bike, can you describe his demeanor for the jury? It was normal, calm. Did you see the defendant at Fort Jefferson Crossing at this point when you're jump starting the dirt bike? I don't recall it, no. How long did it take you to jump start the dirt bike? I don't remember. Did you get it started eventually? Yes. And what did you do with it? I drove it to 585 Dirkwood. And after you got back to 585 Dirkwood with your dirt bike, what did you do? 
I load it on the back of my Tacoma, strap it down, put the 2x10 right next to it, and went down to Sainsbury. Did you go home immediately? No. Where did you go first? <clears throat> um, I stopped by my neighbor's house. He called me um, earlier and asked me, he was going to be away for the weekend, and he asked me if I could... If he could show me a lot around for that weekend, um, he's going to want me to let his dog out because he's not going to be home. And did you do so? No. Why not? I think they had some conversation with his wife and, and he told me to come back later. Now, Mr. Gumini, I, I want to talk to you now about an agreement that you have with the state's attorney's office. Yes. Are you familiar with that agreement? Which one? The grant of immunity? Yes. Now, Mr. Gumini, in 2019, did you retain the services of an attorney? Yes. And what's the name of your attorney? Lindy Urso. How did you um, get referred to Mr. Urso? I don't remember. Um, it was one of Dulos' lawyers. When you say one of Dulos' lawyers, you're not meaning that Mr. Urso was one of Dulos. Lawyers, correct? No, no, it was referred to me by one of Dulos lawyers. And in 2019, um, Mr. Urso had a conversation with then state's attorney Colangelo, is that correct? Yes. And state's attorney, former state's attorney Colangelo indicated that you may not be charged with the crime of hindering prosecution if you agreed to cooperate with the investigation prosecution of others in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Farber Dulos on May 24, 2019. Is that correct? I believe that was verbal agreement at that time, yes. And more recently, specifically on December 4th, 2023, the current state's attorney, Mr. Forensic, put that agreement in writing. Is that correct? Yes. May I have this marked for ID? Yes. Judge, this is States 124. I don't think there's an objection. I have no objection. States 124 admitted as full. Okay, I'm gonna, if I may, Your Honor, just. <clears throat> I haven't endeavored with this machine yet, Judge, so Attorney Manning's going to help me. Mr. Gumini, have you seen this document before? Yes. <clears throat> and is this the uh, grant of immunity from my boss, State's Attorney Forensic, to you in connection with this case? Yes. And it indicates that you will not be prosecuted in connection with this case unless you perjure yourself or act in contempt of court. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. 
returning 124 to the What did you do on the evening of uh, May 24th, if you recall? I'm sorry, can, I, can you repeat the question? Sure, May 24th, 2019, after you got home, do you recall what you did? No. I want to direct your attention now to that Saturday, May 25th, 2019. Did you and your family have plans? Yes. And what were those plans? It was my wife's birthday party. Earlier in the day, um, had you had any communications about selling a lawnmower? Yes. Tell the jury about that. I have an ad on uh, Craigslist, I believe, or that was... Um... Your Honor, I'm going to object on relevance ground. I don't think this has anything, it certainly has nothing to do with my client. I don't even think it has anything to do with the case. Well, the court does not know where this line leads, so the court is going to allow some leeway over rules. Do you remember it was on May 25th? Yes, I'm pretty sure. And you indicated you had an ad on Craigslist? I believe it was offer up for Craigslist. And did you actually sell the lawnmower that day? Yes. Who did you sell it to, if you recall? I don't. Was it a male or a female? I don't. And approximately what time of day was this? Which again, Your Honor, it, it, well, was, it has nothing to do with anything. Well, else. we don't know that, counsel. The court is going to ask counsel, where is this going? Well, I'm just uh, describing his day, Your Honor. It is getting to a phone call that he receives. I'm just walking the jury through the day. Well, that is not relevant. Sustain. Do you recall what time your wife's birthday party started? I believe people will start coming in around lunchtime. And did you receive a phone call from Mr. Jules on the 25th? Yes, I did. And approximately what time of day was this, if you recall? It had to be in the afternoon. Do you remember what Mr. Hulo said to you? That he doesn't have his phone to call him on this phone from now on. Did he say anything to you about Jennifer Dulos at that point? No. I want to direct your attention now to Sunday, May 26th. Did you receive another phone call from Mr. Dulos? Yes. Do you recall approximately what time of day you received this phone call? It had to be in the afternoon. And was he calling you from that new phone number that he'd given you the night before? I believe so. Describe that conversation for the jury. Dulles told me that um, um, Jennifer is missing. Um, that... Um, I don't recall exactly that conversation. Um, he said that he wishes that she's going to show up, that that would show that she's not um, capable of overseeing the kids. And, um, and he was asking me when I'm going to be back and work, to work. Were you surprised when he asked you that? I'm going to object to his, to that, Your Honor. I'll rephrase. No I'll rephrase. Was Monday supposed to be a scheduled off day for four group? Yes. And was that in recognition of the Memorial Day holiday? Yes. So given that you had a scheduled off day, what did you say to Mr. Julius about when you'd be returning to work? Tuesday.
did you see either Mr. Dulos or the defendant the weekend of May 25th, 26th, and including the holiday 27th? No. I want to uh, direct your attention now to Tuesday, May 28th, the day that you returned to work. Yes. How did you get to work? I drove my Tacoma. And do you recall whether or not this is the first time you'd operated it since Friday? I don't recall it. Approximately what time did you arrive at work? Around 8 o'clock in the morning. And just to be clear, when we say work, you're not driving directly to a project site. You're going to the office of Fort Jefferson Crossing. Is that correct? Yes. When you arrived at Fort Jefferson Crossing at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, May 28th, where did you go? I I went into the kitchen um, for Jefferson Crossing. Why did you go into the kitchen? To ask Dulles what vehicle I'm taking and give him the key to, to my Tacoma. And was this your routine every Monday? Yes. Unless I saw him in the office. I'm sorry? Unless I saw him in the office. When you um, got to the kitchen, who did you see? I saw Torres Lewis and Michelle Tupac. And where were they located? They were standing in the kitchen. And can you just describe the kitchen for the jury? Um, so when you walk into the kitchen from the mudroom, it was a big island kitchen and dining room. Dining table. And where were they standing? They were standing right next to the island. And did you have a conversation with Mr. Dulos and the defendant? Yes. What did Mr. Dulos say to you? Dulos told me that um, Jennifer is still missing. And um, I believe Michelle said uh, that it, 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 it could be the lawyers, they, they play in games. And so after the defendant said it could be the lawyers playing games, did Mr. Duo say anything else? He asked me where was I on Friday. How did you re respond to that? I told him that I was in New Canaan. Are you surprised that he was asking you that? Yep. Yeah. What else did he say? He asked me if there was um, any contractors with me. And I told him that I think yes, but I'm not sure. And did he say anything about writing down your whereabouts? I'm going to object leading and hearsay. Well, sustained on leading. What else did Mr. Dulo say to you? He asked me if I was calling him this, that morning. I'm sorry? He was asking me if I was calling him that morning. <clears throat> calling him from your phone? Yes. And after he asked you this, what did he do? I, I said, I don't remember. Let me look at my phone. And um, I pulled my phone out. And I started looking at it. And he asked me if he can, if he can see it. And what happened next? So I, I hand him my phone and, and he started looking through my calling history, I guess. Approximately how long did you have your phone? I want to say a few minutes, five minutes. And how far away was he from you when you when he had your phone? About six feet. What's the defendant doing as Mr. Dulos has your phone? She was standing right next to me. Did Mr. Dulos ever bring up writing a timeline? Yes. 
Tell the jury about that portion of the conversation. He told me that um, um, police took his phone, uh, that he spoke with his attorney, and he told him to to write down the timeline. And um, he told me to look through my phone and and write down where I was, who was, why it, throughout the day. <clears throat> what did you say when he told you to write down where you were throughout the day? I was surprised. I told him, and what am I going to do if police is going to come over and ask me? I'm going to pull out a piece of paper and read it to them. So you did not agree to write a timeline? No. Did you find it strange that he was asking you to write a timeline in the first place? Objection relevance. Overruled. Did you find it strange that he was asking you to write a timeline in the first place? Yeah, that's what, that's why I responded that way. After you told Mr. Dulos that you wouldn't be writing a timeline. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? After you told Mr. Dulos that you would not be writing a timeline, did the defendant say anything? Yes, Michelle said that she's not going to write it either. Approximately how long did this conversation between the three of you last? Um, the whole conversation? Yes, sir. Fifteen minutes. And after the conversation ended, did you give Mr. Dulos the key to your Tacoma? Yes. What did you do next? You mean? Well, let, let me uh, let me back up. The conversation ends at some point, correct? Yes. And then, what do you do next? Um, I was asking him what vehicle I'm taking, and um, after going back and forth with Michelle, he told me to take the Jeep. The white Jeep Cherokee? Yes. Incidentally, did you prefer the white Jeep Cherokee? Yes. Why? It was a smaller, quieter vehicle. The Merritt Parkway that I was driving to and from work, it's a narrow road. This is probably a good place to stop yes, for our lunch and recess. Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume at 2 o'clock. Please do not discuss the case.
This Honorable Superior Court is now open and back in session. The Honorable Judge Randolph. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Judge, good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you. Good afternoon. Your Honor, I, I first of all want to thank the court for its indulgence. Uh, we haven't yet worked out the uh, technical issue. Um, and just by way of background, Your Honor, I intend on playing some residential surveillance footage with this particular witness. It was my understanding that this residential surveillance footage was introduced into evidence as State's Exhibit 81. I give, provided Mr. Schoenhorn with clips of the surveillance footage because I've we put them on a separate disc so that we don't have to watch the entirety of the surveillance footage. And Mr. Schoenhorn has indicated a concern that it's his belief that the uh, video, which uh, has been clipped, has been slowed down and is inconsistent with the speed of the original surveillance footage. And so we're attempting to line them up so that we can verify one way or the other whether or not um, that's correct, and if so, uh, to take appropriate action. So I don't know if the court can give us just maybe five more minutes. Well, perhaps uh, more like 20 more minutes is more reasonable. If you have to correct something. Because first of all, you have to determine whether the representation from counsel is accurate. And then if it is accurate, you have to try to sync it. Well, so, the, Your Honor, it is clear that the at least one, if not two of the clips, have been severely slowed down and then speeded up. The question is whether that's a glitch in the original or whether the copy that I, somebody. So that's what I'm, because that would otherwise not be in evidence. That's the issue. Um, perhaps what we should do is uh, take a recess until 2.30. If the problem has been resolved before then, some one can notify the clerk and the clerk can notify the court can come back and respect itself. So we'll take our recess until uh, 2.30 unless uh, the problem is resolved. Yes, Judge.
Guys, this honorable security court is now open and back in session. The honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Please be seated. Are there still concerns with the video? Judge, I think we've worked through most of them, and uh, I, I expect that we'll be fine. Thank you. We can bring the jury in, please. Famous last word. Counsel stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, because we are starting a bit late, we probably will not take our next recess until 345. Couldn't begin. Mr. Gamini, where we left off, we were discussing a conversation that you had had on May 28th with Mr. Dulos and the defendant. Do you recall those questions? Yes. <clears throat> you testified earlier that the defendant had taken your keys from Eating Mountain Spring Road on May 24, 2019. Is that correct? Yes. Did the subject of the defendant having your keys come up during this conversation on May 28th? Yes, it did. Can you explain to the jury how it came up? Dulos was asking me, um, how do we, how do I come back from, from New Canaan and how do we met and, and all that on that day? And I told him uh, that uh, once I get to, to 80 Mountain Spring Road to pick up my truck, there was no key for it. And, um, and he told me, um, not to mention that, not to mention that Michelle had a key. So you brought up the fact that your key wasn't in the coma and Mr. Dulos told you not to mention that Michelle had the key? Yes. What were his exact words, if you recall? I can't remember. Um, let's let's not mention that or or something like that. You testified earlier that there was some conversation about which vehicle you were going to take and that it was agreed that you would take the Cherokee. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Before uh, taking possession of the Cherokee, did you do anything with respect to your Toyota? Yes. Can you tell the jury what you did? So I, um, <clears throat> I load... Um, I believe some mirrors and some plumbing fixtures, maybe shower heads, they were delivered to, to the office. <clears throat> I loaded it into the Jeep so I can take him to New Canaan. And then um, I went back to my Tacoma to grab my tools and, and put them in the Jeep. And then when I look back behind the, the seats, I discover a red bucket with blue, I think it was hoodie or, or jacket. Where exactly was the bucket? Behind one of the seats. Behind one of the seats? Yes. Do you recall which seat? I don't. Had you seen this bucket before? No. Did you put the bucket? Obviously not. It's a home if you'd never seen it before. No, I didn't. Describe for the jury exactly what was in the bucket. Your Honor, um, I think we need a sidebar.
weeks ago, now months ago, uh, well, I should say days ago, there will be times when there is a discussion about evidence that should be heard outside of the presence of the jury because there is no agreement as to whether certain evidence should be admitted and counsel wish to argue whether certain evidence should be admitted. The reason uh, you would be excused is so that you do not hear what that evidence is. So right now we are going to excuse you. This is not a recess. Counsel will make their presentation, the court will rule, and then you will be brought back in. Judge, yes. I think the witness needs to be excused. Oh. Yes, no objection. Duane, you may wait outside. do because at the sidebar, uh, Attorney Schoenhorn uh, began to state his position, so the court will allow Attorney Schoenhorn to speak first. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, what I believe we're about to get into is the discovery of a uh, blue hooded sweatshirt that was found in the red bucket by this uh, witness who then said that he took it out of his truck and placed it in the laundry room. That's my recollection. This was the subject of extensive litigation. In fact, delayed this case for almost a year. I was represented just for the court's edification because I, I don't know if Your Honor was involved back then. I think it was still Jeff White who was handling the case at that time. The, um, the issue arose that a, um, a hooded sweatshirt was turned over by then attorney, um, Tara Knight, that Superior Court Judge Knight, um, to the Police to the state police. It was tested by the state police, a, a navy blue hooded sweatshirt, and it had the, if I recall correctly, the DNA in the neck and maybe in the hood, but in the interior of that sweatshirt. Mr. Um, Tumieni denied that that was his sweatshirt, but then later, uh, after I, I don't know if he consulted with his attorney or not, later said, yes, I actually have that exact same brand in my uh, closet, and that could have been the sweatshirt, but his recollection is that the one that was shown to him was uh, darker than the one he remembers turning in. Now, what makes this more difficult is the state moved to disqualify me because, if Your Honor may recall from the record, um, it turned out that... Um, in the box that was turned over to uh, by um, Ms. Knight, Attorney Knight to the state police, um, there was a letter of conveyance from my office to Attorney Knight uh, regarding the, at least some of the items that were in that box. This led to uh, their motion to disqualify me, my motion to therefore uh, disqualify the state's attorney's office because it uh, involved the... Uh, disclosure and use of an attorney-client privileged communication that I submitted was by my client. As a result, I retained a, an attorney, uh, attorney uh, Galash from, from Bridgeport, who came here, was involved in extensive negotiations. I think the state, Mr. Forensic, uh, brought in a retired state's attorney from Danbury because of the potential of conflict in their office to negotiate, there were several um, discussions that I was not privy to, I'll just note. Um, I was here for the court matters, but there were a lot of negotiations going on. And as I understand it, I believe there was some writing, which I don't have with me, 
that it would be as if that sweatshirt did not exist and the case would proceed without us proceeding with regard to that. My recollection is Mr. Goulash made clear that if, that's, if a sweatshirt was brought up, that that agreement would therefore no longer be in, uh, in effect, and I'd be allowed to cross-examine this witness regarding that. I hear Mr. Um, uh, McGinnis at sidebar saying, well, that's not his understanding. That's my understanding, and I had an attorney. So if we're going to get into this uh, issue, then I would obviously require the presence of Mr. Galash uh, regarding the agreement, some of which I think was put on a record, if I'm not mistaken. But having said that, there's the separate issue that they're not going to be able to tie in that sweatshirt. It's completely irrelevant. But to the extent that it might be, I would be entitled now here in the whatever week of trial, third, fourth week of trial, to cross-examine this witness about his denial of knowledge about that uh, and how his DNA was in the interior of it, and then later admitting, well, it very well could have, after he checked and he realized he had uh, the identical brand sweatshirts in his closet. So that's where we're at. That's why I'm objecting, and I think that it's certainly prejudicial. It's certainly going to raise issues that I you know, want to keep in mind. I denied and, and dis disagreed that there was a conflict of interest that would require me to be disqualified. But that started a very lengthy, months-long process with negotiations between then uh, special assistant states, no, special states attorney, um, Sedensky and Mr. Goulash. So here we are. Here we're about to get into something that um, I submit is certainly irrelevant to my client, but it will be yes. clearly prejudicial since I would be <clears throat> prevented from cross-examining this witness about his uh, claim with regard to that sweatshirt and his uh, prevarication to the police about it until he gave it some additional thought. Well, is that agreement in writing? Judge, if I, I really want to be heard, Judge. Well, the court also wants to be heard. I understand, but. Not but, counsel. The court is going to be heard. Is the agreement in writing? It absolutely is. You may be heard. Thank you, Judge. And I apologize. I just, uh, as I sit here listening to these arguments, I think it completely distorts the record. And so I, I apologize to the court for my riding the wave of zeal, but. Um, I'd like to just clear up the record once and for all as to this particular issue. On, in March of 2021, Tara Knight, then Attorney Knight, now Judge Knight, reached out to then Chief State's Attorney Colangelo and indicated that she had evidence related to the Dulos case. Arrangements were made for certain police personnel to go pick up that evidence. When the police uh, personnel arrived at Tara Knight's office, she had a box and she indicated that she was turning over the evidence to them. When they opened the box, there was a letter from Mr. Schoenhorn to Judge Knight in the box, and there was a blue sweatshirt along with some tools. Now, at that point, Attorney Schoenhorn never claimed attorney-client privilege. The evidence was seized. It was subsequently submitted for DNA testing, and Pavel Gumieni was considered, I believe, I, I don't have the report in front of me, a contributor on that particular blue sweatshirt. Incidentally, the defendant's hair was found on that sweatshirt, along with um, her DNA being on the tools that were in the box, which I think is also relevant here. Attorney Schoenhorn indicated that he would seek to introduce that sweatshirt in evidence in support of, I guess, his theory that Pavel Gumieni was the bicycle rider that was seen on surveillance footage in Exhibit 386, which the court has not yet received into evidence. There's surveillance footage from <clears throat> Canaan in which a bicyclist rides from the general direction of Waveney Park towards Jennifer Dulos' home. It's our theory of the case that that is Mr. Dulos on his childhood bicycle. I told Mr. Schoenhorn at that point, 
that if you seek to introduce this sweatshirt, which was identified as State Police Exhibit 591 through 596, I believe were the exact item numbers, that it was my position that he would be a witness in the case because he was a necessary witness in the chain of custody at that point. He insisted that he would not concede, that he would not introduce that sweatshirt, that sweatshirt in the case. We proceeded to file a motion to disqualify him on the grounds that he was likely to be a witness given his stated intent to introduce that sweatshirt into the case. He then hired, he, he also misstates what Pavel Gumini said. Pavel Gumini never said he owned that exact brand. I believe he said, and I'm relying on my colleagues here, Judge, he indicated that he owned He owns similar shirts to that, and he has had similar shirts looking to the one shown to him. So there was never any identification as to the brand. Mr. Schoenhorn hired attorney Goulash to represent him in a potential disqualification proceeding. Attorney Goulash for months negotiated with myself and attorney Sedensky to basically get us to agree to not introduce the Weed Street footage, which shows the bicyclist, in exchange for Mr. Schoenhorn not using the sweatshirt during the trial. We refused. And we were prepared to proceed with the disqualification hearing. And you'll recall, Judge, because we actually filed a motion to seal the courtroom. And the court granted the motion to seal the courtroom. Attorney Goulash, at the 11th hour, reached an agreement and I believe I was actually part of this agreement. I was certainly the one standing there on the record when we effectuated it. That the Mr. Schoenhorn would agree to not use that sweatshirt, which was identified as Exhibit 591, or any of the items identified as 591 through 596, i.e., the items that were seized at Tara Knight's office. And in exchange for that, the state indicated, well, that he's no longer a necessary witness. Judge White did an extensive canvas of the defendant on the record, and she waived any potential conflict from Attorney Schoenhorn conceding that he would not use items 591 through 596. There was never an agreement, ever, where the state said that we would not mention the red bucket or the sweatshirt inside of it during testimony. And the reason for that, Judge, is because there is no way, absent Mr. Schoenhorn, I guess, potentially testifying, to say that the sweatshirt which was in that bucket is the same sweatshirt that Mr. Schoenhorn turned over to the state police in March of 2022 through Tara Knight. So I think, quite frankly, this is a huge distortion of the record. The stipulation should be in the clerk's file. I believe... And I, and I want to be clear, Judge, and I'm trying my best to stay calm. I am saying this in the strongest of terms, that this is a complete distortion of the record. And I'm just going to pass forward the actual agreement in writing, which begins with stipulation regarding state police evidence items 591 through 596. And this is full already, correct? Well, Judge, that was uh, a stipulated agreement between the parties. Uh, I don't know if it was received. Out of another proceeding. Correct, sir. Yes. The stipulation is in two paragraphs. The first paragraph reads, and 
first the court will put this stipulation into context. The stipulation uh, is an agreement that addresses whether Attorney Schoenhorn is likely to be a necessary witness at trial. That's the context of the stipulation. The defendant, this is paragraph one, the defendant will not under any circumstances introduce any evidence during trial in the above captioned matters concerning a box or its contents which were seized at then Attorney Tara Knight's office on March 23rd, 2021 and log into evidence as state police items 0591 through 0596 and the parties will proceed as though the contents of the box did not exist. Now, so that the court is clear, the bucket and the hoodie are not contents of the box. That's a question. They never, there was never any evidence that they were, Judge. And so, to, to be clear, the state does not concede that that's the same sweatshirt. As a matter of fact, when Pavel Gumini was interviewed about it, he indicated that the sweatshirt that he saw was darker in color. And so, the only evidence is it wasn't the same sweatshirt. And there was no bucket in the box, correct? There was not, sir. Well, as this was a stipulation between the parties, the court is not going to litigate the stipulation. This is a matter of record. The representation by the state it is that the bucket and the hoodie were not contents of the box. That's the representation of the state. Attorney McGinnis, specifically as an officer of the court. Well, I just want to be, just, I don't want to interrupt, I just want to be clear. There's no evidence that it was, and so that's my position. And the defense specifically indicated that they would not, under any circumstances, introduce those items. And we offered something in exchange for that. But what we offered was not, we did not indicate we would not mention the bucket or the sweatshirt that was in the bucket at all. What we offered was to withdraw our motion. May I respond? Yes. At sidebar, I did not say I intended to introduce the contents of the box. What I said at sidebar is this opens the door to me cross-examining this witness about him being shown a sweatshirt that had been tested by the lab. He was told it had his DNA in it, but he claimed he didn't recognize it. He doesn't know how his DNA got on it. And then later, I don't remember, I'd have to go back and look at the uh, report, at, at a later time, he contacted the police, I can't remember directly or through his attorney, that said, well, wait a minute, I went back and I looked at my sweatshirts that I have in my closet, and I realized that very well could be my sweatshirt. So it goes to the right to cross-examine the witness. I and my attorney took the position that there was no basis whatsoever for me to be a witness since I never intended to introduce the actual sweatshirt. It was, it's on video that this witness was interrogated about it, shown a sweatshirt. It has the initial CMR, which Your Honor now knows, are the initials of Christine M. Roy, since we've seen her name and her initials on dozens of items. And therefore, I wanted to uh, alert the court that as a result of that, I would intend to cross-examine this witness about his reaction to being shown a sweatshirt, his claim that this that he was shown a navy blue sweatshirt, and that it was actually the one he saw was lighter than that that he recalls, and therefore it goes directly to the right of cross examination. But I also want to point out this is also putting the um, cart before the horse because the claim the court should look at these 
so-called bicycle video. It's a misrepresentation that this bicyclist that one sees for approximately two or three seconds is in any way clear, visible, you cannot tell gender, height, anything. Somebody whizzes by in a camera, that's, that's, I should know one of which is stop action. So you see blurry clips. So the fact that this probably is not even relevant anyway, the court should understand this goes down a slippery slope. If it's allowed in, I, sh I, I believe I have the right to cross-examine, and I'm not going to introduce the contents of the box. And that's all I stipulated to. In a, but in addition, if the court, you know, this, this is the theory. This is the theory that the police made up. There's a bicyclist a half hour away from Wells Lane, riding on, on a, a street called Weed Street in New Canaan. It is not even a direct route to, um, to um, Wells Lane, and it's certainly not captured on any cameras near Wells Lane. So to suggest that there is a bucket with a sweatshirt in it that somehow the court or that the jury should then infer from that that from a anonymous bicyclist that this might be the same thing when there's no evidence of that and there's no evidence of a bicyclist arriving at um, Wells Lane, you know, gets back to the issue of what I would get to cross-examine about. Well, first, as the court reads the stipulation, stipulation uses the language introducing the evidence. The court is reading that broadly. The court is not reading that as the first party to introduce this evidence as the party that is introducing this evidence. The court reads that as puts into evidence at any time, even through cross-examination. So Again, the fact that the stipulation reads, introduce any evidence, does not, in this court's view, indicate that the only way that evidence can be introduced is through other than cross-examination. The state does not intend to introduce evidence of the box. The state is introducing evidence of a bucket and a hoodie in the back of the Tacoma. How we get to the box at Attorney Knight's office is a mystery. In other words, the court is indicating that the fact that the state is introducing evidence of a bucket and a hoodie does not carry us to cross-examination concerning a box in the possession of Attorney Knight. So as the court, the court did not read the second paragraph. In exchange for the defendant's agreement not to introduce said evidence and proceed as though the contents of the box do not exist, the state agrees that the first argument in its motion to disqualify filed on October 11, 2022 is now moved to wit that Sean Horn is likely to be a necessary witness at trial, and thus there's a compelling need for his testimony. In order for us to even understand the stipulation, we have to understand the distinction between what's in the box and what's in the Tacoma. The state is representing that there's no evidence that what was in the Tacoma was in the box. And I'm representing to the court that it very well may have, and therefore I'm a right to. He was questioned, forget about the box. 
he was questioned about a sweatshirt. Because when this sweatshirt was turned in, there was no DNA testing, et cetera, et cetera. He was shown a sweatshirt. He didn't recognize the um, initials on them that said CMR. I'm just looking at notes right now. Is this a videotaped interview with this witness? I mean, technically, to the extent that it is relevant, I could cross-examine about the contents of the video. There's no mention of the box, if I recall, in that interview. He's shown a sweatshirt. He, laid, he denies that it's his sweatshirt. He then says, well, this looks darker than the sweatshirt that um, I recall seeing. The problem is, is these so-called blurry videos show a very dark, almost black, uh, hooded sweatshirt. So no, I'm saying this is a slippery slope because it's also putting, as I said, the cart before the horse. The court has to even entertain whether these, these um, clips, these, these fast clips of a blurry bicyclist, have anything to do with this case. Anything. There's no one who's going to identify this other than the state claiming that they think it's Fotos Dulos riding on a bicycle. But the only sweatshirt that, that Mr. Uh, Umieni has shown has his own DNA in it, and he doesn't understand why, and then later says, well, that could be mine. Again, so, well, again, the court is reading the language shall not introduce broadly. And to put it in lay terms, no mention. That's how the court reads it. No mention at any time. So the court is going to allow the inquiry Of course, these matters are preserved for appellate review. But again, the court is not going to choke the spirit of the stipulation by using. Court is going to use this term a noose for the term shall not introduce. We're not going to choke the stipulation for it simply to mean other than in cross examination. We can bring the jury back in. I'm not sure I understand. Does that mean the court is precluding me from cross examining this witness about his interrogation? by the police regarding them showing him a dark sweatshirt. If that is contents of the box, yes. Well, to be honest, I don't believe that the video indicates where it came from. I'm assuming that's what they showed him. But again, just based on the chronology, but I want to be clear that the court is precluding me from cross-examining the witness about being shown a sweatshirt that um, they told him had his DNA, that he denied it was his, later said it might be his, but it was a different color. It was darker than the one he recalls seeing in a bucket. Judge McGinnis. Judge, the defendant precluded herself when she entered into, into this agreement. Mr. Schoenhorn precluded himself when he entered into this agreement in exchange for the state withdrawing a very colorable motion to disqualify. And it is the height of disingenuousness to stand here and say, they showed him a sweatshirt from the contents of the box that I've agreed not under any circumstances to mention and proceed as though it doesn't exist, and then to cross-examine him about those very contents. The court is in agreement with the characterization that it is the stipulation that precludes the cross-examination, not the court. We can bring the jury in.
Council stipulate? Yes, Judge. You may proceed, Attorney McGill. <coughs> Mr. Committee, I, I can't remember exactly where we left off, but I think you were discussing a bucket that you had found in your Toyota Tacoma. Is that correct? Yes. <coughs> and what was inside the bucket? I believe it was like um, hoodie or or jacket, blue collar. And what color was the bucket? Red. He described the bucket for the jury in terms of its size. It was um, smaller than five gallon bucket with like a, you know, like little nose in it, like cleaning bucket that you can makes it easier to pour it to water to a smaller container. Did you notice anything else in your vehicle at that time? No. What, if anything, did you do with the bucket? I took the bucket and I went upstairs um, through the office. I didn't see um, Dulos there, so I left it in the laundry room. And then I believe I saw him on my way back when I gave him back the key to my Tacoma. And I told him that I left the bucket in the, uh, in the laundry room. Did he say anything about the bucket? I. I said, like, thank you. I don't recall it. After you had this conversation with Mr. Dulos, what did you do? I uh, went to work, went to New Canaan. Back to 61 Sturbridge? Yes. And what vehicle did you take? The Jeep. Where did you park your Tacoma at Fort Jefferson Crossing prior to leaving? Um, I believe I left it at the, at the grass parking spot. <clears throat> now, this uh, week month began Monday, May 27th. I want to talk to you about other things that happened during that week, if I could. Uh, did there come a point during that week where you helped the defendant move firewood? Yes. Do you recall exactly what day that was? No. But you can tell us it's sometime the week of May 27th? I believe so, yes. Where were you moving firewood from? He has a um, <clears throat> um, woodshed on the um, right back corner of his property. And did the topic of Jennifer Dulos's disappearance come up? Yes. Who brought it up? Michelle. And do you recall what the defendant said to you about Jennifer Dulos's disappearance? Yes. So Michelle was upset that um, um, her and her daughter pictures were posted by the news online, um, and she said. Uh, um, I'm gonna kill that fucking bitch when she's gonna turn up. And um, I said, don't say that. And she said, uh, um, so she, that she's gonna be suing the news. She's writing down who posted what, what pictures. And I believe at that time, Dulos walked out of um, um, dining room door. And then he was asking us, it like, became it. Awkward. He asking us, well, "What are you guys doing?" And and Michelle said, uh, "Nothing. We're just talking." Like this is how the conversation ended. And Mr. Gumeni, um, you've recently disclosed that conversation. Is that correct? Yes. Why did you decide to recently tell my office about that conversation? I. Um, you know, those things, I, I didn't think people say those kind of things, and they don't mean it. And um, and I just, I was just wanted to minimize my involvement in all this. When you say minimize your involvement, what do you mean? Like, like I said, I, I don't, I didn't think that, that I was supposed to say those kind of things, I guess. Did there come a point in time that same week where
where you had a conversation with Mr. Dulos about your vehicle? Yes. Do you recall what day this was? I don't. With uh, ever since I gave police my my phone, I I basically couldn't recover exactly the dates and and times of of what things happened when. Um, Can you give us an estimate as to when this conversation took place? I believe it was either Tuesday or Wednesday. Tell the jury, um, firstly, where that conversation took place. At Fort Jefferson. Why did you go back to Fort Jefferson? I, um, when I switched cars on Monday, I left my truck at Fort Jefferson and I forgot to take um, uh, my vape charger from that truck to, to transfer it to, to the Jeep. Attorney McGinnis, at this point, the, the dates have not been clear. Certainly. You indicated that you believe this conversation took place on Tuesday or Wednesday, so that would have been either May 28th or May 29th, correct? Correct. Thank you. So you went to get your vape charger, and maybe for those of us that don't know, vaping is electronic. Sorry, can you repeat it? Vaping is electronic cigarettes? Yes. And you had a charger in your truck? Yes. Okay. Approximately what time did you arrive at Fort Jefferson Crossing? I don't remember. It had to be after lunch. When you got to Fort Jefferson Crossing, was anyone home? I didn't see anybody, no. And because you didn't see anyone, did you make a phone call? Yes. Who did you call? Dulos. And did he answer the phone? Yes. Could you tell the jury about that conversation? So I call him and I ask him, uh, where's, like, photos? you have my truck? And he says, yes, I'm coming back from the car wash. And I told him, you wash my truck? He says, yes. I said to him, thank you. Did you get it fixed too? I made a joke out of it. <clears throat> he says, no, just wash. And did he indicate whether he was coming back to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, he said, I'm coming back. From the car wash. Did he arrive back at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Approximately how long between your phone call with Mr. Dulos did he arrive at Fort Jefferson Crossing? I don't know. Not long, a few, few minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And on which date is this, please? He's indicating either Tuesday the 28th or Wednesday the 29th. Thank you. You're not sure which date, correct? And when he arrived at Fort Jefferson Crossing, where did he go? He parked the, the car on the uh, grass parking lot. Were you able to view your Tacoma? Yes. How did the exterior appear to you? It was just washed. And when Mr. Julos parked the Tacoma, what happened next? He opened the door and he started playing with the, with the side handle on the seat. And, and he told me, what's up with this? This doesn't work. Um, the seats are not original. He told me, um, they look ghetto. You should get rid of them. You should change them. And I told him, yeah, I know. It, it's, you know, the truck has other problems. I got to get to it. Um, it's, um, it's leaking oil and, and things like that. And I told him, I'll get to it. He says, but he told me, no, no, you, like, you should change the seats. You should fix the truck, the truck sell it, or, or lower the price and, and sell the truck. I'll give you a good deal on the Jeep. I'm going to check the hearsay. The court does not hear it as being offered by counsel for the truth of the matter asserted. That's correct, Judge. Overruled. 
And I told him, I, I don't want your Jeep. I need something that it's all wheel drive for snow plowing. Um, you indicated lower the price on the on your vehicle. Were you were you trying to sell your vehicle? I I had that in mind for like a year to get to upgrade it to get a better truck, but I didn't post it anywhere all over the world. You told us earlier that you actually would use the Tacoma for snow plowing in the winter. Is that correct? Yes. So having a uh, a vehicle that had the ability to hold a mount for a plow was important to you? Yes. And would the Jeep Cherokee have been? It was two-wheel drive. It, it's just not. The Jeep Cherokee wasn't all-wheel drive. And... Did Mr. Dulos mention you go to a dealership also? I believe that he mentioned that to me on, um, on another day. When Mr. Dulos arrived back from the car wash, was he alone? Yes. Did you see the defendant at any point during this conversation, Mr. Julius, about the car wash? I don't recall it, no. Now, after you had this conversation with Mr. Dulos, did you take your Tacoma key back? I believe when he got out of the truck and he was telling me about the seats, <clears throat> he handed me the key. Now, uh, did he tell you why he was giving you the key? No. What did you do with the key? <coughs> Just put it in my pocket. And did you go home that evening? Yes. What vehicle did you take home? The Jeep. When you um, were speaking with Mr. Julius, did you have a chance to look inside the vehicle also? When I was, uh, when I got in there to grab my uh, dual charger, um, I, I looked inside, yes. And how did the interior of the vehicle appear? It, it looked clean. How many years had you been leaving your Tacoma at Fort Jefferson Crossing? When I was managing projects around um, Farmington area, I would not um, drive company vehicles that, that, as much. Um, so mainly there was two projects that I did in New Canaan and I believe Darien, that was 175, from, I can't remember the address. So I want to say like a year, maybe a year and a half. And had Mr. Dulos ever washed your truck? Prior to that day? Yes. No. Had he ever had the interior of your truck cleaned? No. Did you ask Mr. Dulos to do either of those things? Now, after you went home with the Jeep, did there come a point in time that same week where Mr. Julos called you about your Tacoma? Yes. Do you recall what day that was? No. What did Mr. Julos say to you in that conversation? He said, uh, he called me and he told me, uh, the news are here, um, you truck is um, outside, Objection I don't have a key. Saying, if I may judge his own being offered to explain why he went back to Fort Jefferson Crossing. Doesn't sound like it's going there. Well, the uh, question was, what did he say? The response, the beginning of the response was, the news is here. Can you sharpen the question? Did Mr. Dulos in that conversation ask you to do anything? Yes. What did he ask you to do during that conversation? He asked me to, to, to come up to Fort Jefferson and take my truck home or park it in the garage. And did he tell you why? 
because the news were there. And he didn't have a key. <clears throat> did you go to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Who did you go to Fort Jefferson Crossing with? I asked my wife to give me one. Now, by this point, you knew that Jennifer Dulos was missing, correct? Yes. Were you nervous at all about the fact that Mr. Dulos had washed your truck? Not until I have this next conversation with him. At this point, were you suspicious that Mr. Dulos was involved in Your Honor, I'm going to object this is now leading and irrelevant. But so well, you could ask him how he reacted, but he's asking a leading question. Well, the testimony so far is that the court is characterizing the testimony. Mr. Dulos had kept the coma out of the possession of the owner for a period of time. The next question characterizes, were you suspicious having heard that Jennifer Dulos had disappeared? The, the previous question, if I may um, recall, was that he went and picked up the car and his wife brought him there. So it wasn't about being, there was nothing about him keeping the vehicle at that time. He had taken the key, he was asked to take the car because, quote, the news was there. And then we get into... Well, he was suspicious at this point, and that's what I'm objecting. Well, the court understands counsel's uh, concern, but the evidence already is that at some time before the, this conversation, Mr. Kumani wanted his truck at a certain time, and it wasn't given to him. And so the question as the court hears it is, taking all of this into account, including the disappearance of Jennifer Doodles, did you become suspicious? Overruled. Mr. Gumini, at, at this point, were you suspicious that Mr. Doodles was involved in the disappearance of Jennifer Doodles? Not at this point, no. <clears throat> Can you tell the jury why not? I I knew this guy for a very long time, and, and I, I trusted him that he was a good guy. I want to direct your attention now to Thursday, May 30th, 2019. Did you have another conversation with Mr. Dulos about the seats? I believe that was the Thursday that we had the conversation, yes. What was the date again, please, counsel? May 30th, 2019. How did that conversation begin? I believe he started with um, um, telling me if I wanted to go down the road to the Chevy dealer and see if I can buy a small Chevy. And I told him um, that I don't like Chevys. I like Tacoma. And he um, he told me he asked me where where can I buy seats, John Kerry. Um, and I told him, yeah, I think I can get them in John Kerry. He told me um, go to John Kerry, um, get Tacoma seats or some other seats. Pay cash, and I will reimburse you for it. And then there was um, conversation about work. He asked me what I was what I was gonna do tomorrow, and I told him I have to go to New Canaan. Um, I believe I had to meet with uh, with the Gaga guy, and I had some other things to do over there. And he told me yes, so go do that. And and after. Um, Go to Junkyard and buy seats. <clears throat> and um, and he told me if, if I call you or if I um, if we talk talk about it on the phone, um, let's not call it seats. Let's call it hardware. 
was this conversation that you were having with Mr. Dulos in which you referenced the term hardware in person or over the telephone? I believe in person. Do you remember where it was? At Fort Jefferson. Do you remember about what time of day it was? I don't. When Mr. Dulos indicated that he wanted to refer to the seats as hardware, how did you react? I didn't know what to say. I, I, I was shocked. I, I just, I didn't say anything. Did you agree to try to find seats? I did when next day I did went to Junker. After this conversation, were you growing nervous or suspicious about Mr. Dulos? Yes. So why did you agree to go to a junkyard? I wanted to, I didn't want to lose my job. I, I, I had a wife, two kids. I, he was my main income, health insurance. And on top of all that, I have a non-compete side signed with him. So if I lose my job, I, I'll have to move out of state, basically. There was a guy who, <clears throat> who used to work for him and, um, and quit his job. And then he was going after him really hard with the non-compete. When you say he was going after him really hard, you're referring to Mr. Dulos yeah. going after the former employee really hard? Is that correct? Yes. What were your plans for Friday, May 31st, 2019? I was going to go and meet with the uh, daughter guy at uh, 61 Sturbridge. And, um, and I have some things I was doing at uh, 61 Sturbridge. And I believe in that week I had a flood in the basement. I, uh, I might have brought some dehumidifiers and set them in the basement. And had you been in communication with Mr. Dulos during the course of that week about the project at 61 Sturbridge? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> and would that communication have been over the telephone? Yep. Approximately, uh, well, did you travel to 61 Sturbridge on Friday, May 31st? I believe so, yeah. What time did you arrive? I don't remember. What well, would it have been? Morning, afternoon, evening? It would have been morning. And when you arrived, what was going on at the house? I believe the gutter guy was there. I met with him. And I, I could have set up the, the humidifiers in the basement. Approximately how long were you at 61 Sturbridge? I believe I left uh, shortly before noon. Was the uh, gutter guy still there? Yes. After you left 61 Sturbridge, where did you go? I was driving back um, towards Farmington. And are you still in the white Jeep Cherokee at this point? Yes. When you were on your way back towards Farmington, did you receive any phone calls? I believe uh, Dulos called me, yes. <laughs> what did Mr. Dulos say to you? He asked me um, if I was going to go and get the, get the hardware, meaning the seats. Was this the first time he had referred to the seats hardware with you over the telephone? I believe so, yes. What were you thinking as he said this? Objection. Well, what were you thinking when he said, are you going to go get the hardware? Ground. Speculation, irrelevant. His... 
what he was thinking. For all I know, he was thinking about um, going to the movies. Well, um, maybe I could. The question can be asked in a different way. So, as, as asked, sustained. Mr. Gimeni, when Mr. Dulos referred to the hardware, were you thinking about going to the movies? No. What were you thinking? Again, and, uh, speculation and uh, relevance. Well, the witness would know what he was thinking. However, what can be asked, because what the witness was thinking may not have become what the witness acted on. So perhaps it can even be a sharper question. After Mr. Dulos asked you whether or not you'd taken care of the hardware, what did you say? He said, I'm going to go and look and see if I can find anything. Were you feeling nervous at this point? Yes, I was. Um, I was trying to figure out what, what's what's going on. How is Mr. Dulos acting with you on the telephone? Was he acting normally? Was he acting uh, out of the ordinary? No, I mean, I'm checked the word acting. There's a way to ask this question, but how does he know how he's acting over the phone? Well, uh, counsel is left to the manner in which he wishes to ask the question. So that's overruled. How was he acting, sir? He was speaking only. After this conversation, where did you go? I went to uh, junkyard. Which junkyard? Chuck and Addis in Saudi Coast. Approximately what time did you arrive at the junkyard? Um, I'm guessing around maybe 1 o'clock. And when you got to Chuck and Eddie's in Southampton, what did you do? I was just walking around and, and thinking of uh, what's going on, um, why does he want me to change the seats? I was trying to analyze him um, that Friday when I met with him on the, on the 24, um, you know, and, and I was trying to thinking like, how do I get out of it? Not, not to get fired basically and, and, and not to change the seat. Did you end up purchasing seats at the junkyard? No. How many uh, vehicles does Chuck and Eddie's have? I I don't know. I guess probably 400. Did you walk around the junkyard? Yes. Did you decide not to purchase any seats? Yes. Incidentally, um, you testified earlier that you were referred to Mr. Urso by one of Mr. Julius's attorneys. Is that correct? Yes. Um, did you ever uh, speak with Mr. Dulos or his attorney at the same time during that week of May 27th? I did. And did the subject of your green card status come up during that conversation? Um, over the phone, no. Did it come up at any point? Yes. When did it come up? I don't remember the date. Um, he sent me... Um, Let's just be clear, when you say he, who's that? Dulos. Send me... <clears throat> I believe his lawyer, phone number, and, and uh, his best friend, Mark Marcial. And uh, he told me, I, I send you some phone numbers in case 
um, if you get approached by police or something, don't don't talk to them. Um, call the lawyer. Haven't talked to the lawyer. And I I told them I can I can just talk to them and I can just tell them where I was. Like, why do I need a lawyer for this? And he told me that no, no, you you don't understand. You're on your green card here. Um, you don't want to talk to police. Um, they're gonna put you in the corner. They're gonna ask you questions. They're gonna lie to you. Um, they're gonna tra threaten you. That they're gonna arrest you and deport you out of here. You, you don't want to do that. You just haven't talked to the lawyer. How did you feel as he was saying these things? Your Honor, can we get a, um, a uh, time frame, first of all? And second of all, it's, uh, I thought he said it was an email. Now it's sounding like it's a telephone conversation, which I'm not sure I understand. And then third, how does he feel about that is irrelevant. So well, Judge, first, if the whole thing is irrelevant, we need not address the first two. Overruled. How did you feel after this conversation about your green card status? Well, I don't think he said anything. The question had it. Well, this is the this is now the question. If the other question was different, apparently it has been abandoned. So you can ask the question again. How did you feel about how did you feel after this conversation about your green card status? Well, I'm going to get, again, I'm going to object. I don't believe his answer said anything about his green card status. Well, the response was, you don't want to talk to the police. They'll put you in a corner. They'll lie. And something about the green card. Also that he would be deported. So you may answer the question. I I just told him. I said I don't understand why you don't want me to talk to the police. I I you know I can just tell him where I was and what's going on. How long did you walk around Chuck and Eddie's for? I want to say like an hour, maybe two. And did you eventually leave Chuck and Eddie's? Yes. Where did you go? I went to uh, second junkyard. Um, it was more like a like a used parts junkyard. Um, and I asked the guy there at the register if I gave him my year and model of my my the call line and asking me if he um, if he has a seats for that kind of truck. And he told me yes. Um, they were like hundred and fifty dollars and you can have them in two days. If you were growing increasingly suspicious about Mr. Julos, why did you go to the second junkyard? Because I was like thinking about what's going on and 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 how to get out of it. And, and I wanted to go back um, to the office and tell them that I can't find him and I can't change it. Did you make a deal with the person at the second junkyard for the seats? No. After not making the deal, what did you do? I stopped by one more body shop in, um, I believe it was Plan B or, 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 um, or Bristol. And what did you do there? I asked the guy if he has some seats for my truck and then if he can um, fix some mechanical issues. And did he have seats? He showed me two vehicles and told me you can have those. Tonight. After this third junkyard, what did you do? I went back to the office. Approximately what time of day was this? I want to say 3, 3.30, 4 o'clock, maybe 2.30. I can't really remember. 
And on what day is this attorney? Uh, Friday, May 31st, correct? Thank you. Yes. When you arrived at Fort Jefferson between 3.30 and 4 o'clock, where did you go? I went upstairs to the office. When you got into the office, was anyone present? Dulles was, yes. Did you speak with Mr. Dulles at that time? Yes. What did you say to Mr. Dulos? I just couldn't hold it anymore, and I, I just went off on him. I told him, um, what's up with my truck? Why did you clean it? And uh, he smiled at me and says, because you were never going to do it. And I told him, seriously, why did you clean my truck? And he says, don't worry about it. There's nothing going on. Um, I went to Jennifer's house for Mother's Day. I gave her a hug. I hold the cat. Um, and then I came back, and then I was uh, I was having the same clothes, and I was driving a truck. Um, there might be hair in it or something. I just want to clean everything. The police might come over, come in. Um, they find something. They then destroy my name, destroy the, the company name. No one's gonna ever want to build it with me. And I said, Why do you want me to change the seats? What's up with the seats? And, and he's, he said, um, like, can we not talk about it? Can you just do it? And then uh, he keep on pressing me and pressing me on it. And then uh, let me let me stop you there. When you say he kept keeps on pressing you and pressing you, can you describe his demeanor for the jury? Yeah, he he like um, he was growing angry and 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 he keep on saying like you gotta do it. You 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 can you do it? Did he appear scared? At uh, a little bit later, please. <clears throat> After he pressed you, did you make any suggestions to him? Yeah, I, he become um, scared and angry when I told him that that um, I went to a couple junk cards. I I can't change him because I don't physically have him. I I, I put him by him. And what do you want me to do? And then um, he keep, kept pressing and kept pressing, and he was going angry. And, and I finally said, that the only seeds I can think of would be the cayenne seeds. And he says, yeah, yeah, do that. And just to refresh the member's memory, the cayenne is the Porsche Cayenne at 585 Deer Cliff Road? Yes. And after Mr. Dulos said, yeah, do that, what happened next in the conversation? I went to, um, I went to 585. Um, well, let me ask you this before we get there. Did Mr. Dulos offer to help you? Not, not at this point. Okay. So what happened next? Um, I went to 585 and, um, I opened the door, there was like two huge exterior house doors right next to the Cayenne. I had to move those. I opened the door, I got into the, the Cayenne and, and the battery was dead and I couldn't, the seats were electric, I couldn't move them back and forth to get to the bolts. So I was like, screw that. I, I, um, I went back to Fort Jefferson and I told him, <clears throat> listen, the seats are electric. The battery is dead. I can't move him. I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. He says, no, no, you got to do it. Um, get the battery booster. Um, get the wrench and and um, and uh, get him, take him out, change him and, and get rid of him so nobody will ever find him. And then this is, I think this is when he, when he called for me. Um, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to help you. And... After he said, get rid of them so no one will ever find them, offered to help you, did you accept his help? No. Mr. Gamini, 
Did you ever directly ask Mr. Dulos whether or not he had killed his wife? No. Why not? I didn't, it wasn't fitting in my head that he would, he'd have been capable of doing such thing. And, and I just didn't want to lose my job. Why did you think you would lose your job? Because he would get angry with me. After this conversation with Mr. Dulos, what did you do next? I went to 585. I, um, I connected by the jumper. I moved the seats back and then I, I couldn't, um, I didn't have the kind, of, the kind of range, so I went down to Advance Auto or, or Auto Zone store down, down the road in um, Avon, I believe. And I got the wrench and I came back and I unbolted the seats, put them in the Jeep, pushed the big doors back into the garage, closed the door and went back to Fort Jefferson. And when you say you uh, took the seats and put them in the Jeep, we're referring to the Jeep Cherokee, correct? Yes. What area of the Jeep Cherokee did you put the seats? Um, I believe I fell down one of the, the folding seats on the back and and then and I used the, the the trunk area. How long did it take you to remove the seats? Like with that time that I went to the to Alderson and all that? Uh, no, the actual time to physically remove them once you had the wrench. I want to guess like half hour maybe. And after you put the seats in the Jeep Cherokee, where did you go next? Fort Jefferson. So this is a good time for break, Judge. Yeah, we'll take our afternoon recess, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Till four o'clock, uh, please do not discuss this.
This court is now open and back in session. Bring the jury in, please. Stipulate. Yes, Judge. Yes. Can I inquire? Yes. Mr. Gumini, where we left off, you uh, had put the cayenne seats inside of the white Jeep Cherokee. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. And after you did that, where did you go? I drove back to Fort Jefferson, of course. Approximately how long did it take you to get to Fort Jefferson Crossing? One minute. Can you describe the road for Jefferson Crossing for the jury? It's, um, um, I want to say dead end road, like a, with like a cul-de-sac on, on, on the end. So it kind of goes in, there's houses, and then there's like a turnaround, and then goes back out. So would it be fair to say that there's only one entrance and exit to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. When you um, turn on to Fort Jefferson Crossing, is Fort Jefferson Crossing on the right or the left if you're driving? The Fort Jefferson Crossing? Driving from where? Well, well it's one entrance. It's a one entrance to Fort Jefferson Crossing. So if you're driving, the court understands it, the, if you're driving towards Fort Jefferson Crossing, is it on the right or the left? That's correct, sir. Is it, if you're driving to Fort Jefferson Crossing, would it be on the left or the right? Again, I'm Counsel, sorry, you can't goes... come in. You can't come into Fort Jefferson Crossing, jumping over the cul-de-sac. There's one entrance. But driving, you turn left or right, depending on whether you're going north or south. So that's why I don't understand. So Court understands the testimony that you can't enter Fort Jefferson Crossing by any other way than the one way that leads in. If I may just explain, Your Honor, it's my understanding from the maps that, and I've been there, Jefferson Crossing intersects with Eli Road, and we're talking about entering Jefferson Crossing. You can you can go from the left, turn left, or if you're coming from the other direction, you turn right. So I'm just finding the question confusing. Well, of course, understand the question to be once you're on Jefferson Crossing. Oh. Is four on your left or on your right? That's correct, Judge. Once you're on Jefferson Crossing, is four on your left or your right? On the right. And are there any houses before Fort Jefferson Crossing? Or yes. Is it, what address is that? I believe it's two Jefferson Crossing. <clears throat> and when you we're driving towards Fort Jefferson Crossing, and it's on your right. <clears throat> Did you see anything? I see. Um, I saw a couple cars with with some people there. Did you know who they were? Not at the first first look. No. Did you think that they were police officers? Could have been. How fast were you driving at this point? I was going pretty slow. Did you stop before Jefferson Crossing? No. Why not? I I saw cars there, um, and I just didn't want to bother anybody. And I just kept driving. Mr. Grimini, was the fact that you had these seats in the back of your Jeep also a factor in not stopping? No. Where did you go after you passed Fort Jefferson Crossing? I went to the end of the road, I turned around, and I was slowly driving back. 
And as you were slowly driving back, as I understand it, Fort Jefferson Crossing would now be on your left hand side. Is that correct? Yes. Where were you going at that point? I was driving back slowly, and, and um, the police came to the road, and, and they signed me to stop. And did you stop the vehicle? Yes. How many police officers approached you? I don't remember. I want to say three or four. Do you remember a trooper named Detective Michael Buten approaching you? Yes. Did Mr. Buten ask you where you were, excuse me, did Sergeant Buten ask you where you were coming from? Yes. What did you tell him? I believe I told him I was coming from New Canaan. Why did you tell Sergeant Buten that you were coming from New Canaan? I, I, I don't remember. I'm, I could have misunderstood. I could have not. I don't remember. Had you been in New Canaan earlier in the day? Yes. Were you asked to uh, step out of the vehicle at any point? Yes. And what happened when you were asked to step out of the vehicle? He asked me if there is, uh, if I have any drugs or if there is any weapons in the car. And what did you say? I said no. Did you get permission to search the vehicle at that time? He asked me if, if they can look or search the car, and I say yes. Were you nervous at this time? Um. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, my heart is going. I, I just had a heated conversation with Dulos and, and, and I was just removing the seats and fighting with the big doors and the, and the, um, 585. Well, let me ask you this. Were you, were you concerned about the fact that the police were at Mr. Dulos's home? I, it was I. I didn't have time to think. It was. It was just everything was happening fast. And did you tell Sergeant Buten at that time that you were? Well, strike that. Did Sergeant Buten ask you about the seats in the back of the jeep? Yes. And what did you tell him you were doing with the seats? I told him that I, I removed them from the crash can at 585 and I was planning on putting them in my truck. Did you tell him that you were doing that at Duos's instructions? Your Honor, I'm going to object to the bleeding nature. <clears throat> well, well, it is bleeding, but you can I'll, I'll, withdraw, I'll actually withdraw that. Did you tell him that you were doing that at Dulos's instructions at that time? No. Why not? He didn't ask. And why didn't you offer it? I just I didn't want to get into that. I like I didn't know what's what to do. Was a request made of you around this time? Can you share out and try to sharpen the question? Were you asked to call Mr. Dulos? Yes. Do you remember who asked you to call Mr. Dulos? I don't recall who did it. I believe it was, could have been um, Detective Buten, or it could have been, I can't remember the other detective name, Al, o older. Did you meet a Sergeant Al Bisson? Yes. So it could have been Detective Buten or Sergeant Bisson? Yes. And did you call Mr. Dulos? Yes. Did he answer the phone? Yes. What did you say to Mr. Dulos? I told him there's uh, the police is here and they wanted to talk to him. And did he indicate where he was? 
I don't recall if he told me that or he told the uh, detectives there. But I, I found out that he was at the pond where he water skis and, and, um, and he's coming back. When you'd spoken to Mr. Julos earlier in the day about the seats, did he indicate to you at that time that he'd be going to the ponds later in the afternoon? No. What time of night is this or what, what time of day is this? I don't remember. It had to be... Um, around five o'clock, maybe. And uh, did one of the uh, troopers t actually take your phone and walk away with it? Yes. How long did they have the phone for? A few minutes. And when you gave them, did you give them the phone at that time? Yeah, when I started talking to, to Dulos, um, he asked me, like, let me talk to him. And then I just hand him the phone. And were you asked to go to the pond at that point? Yes. Do you remember who asked you to go to the pond? I don't. What is the pond? It's a um, it's a self storage area with like a lake on the back where Dulos um, and his friends go water skiing. Had you ever been water skiing with Mr. Dulos? No. Had you ever been water skiing with the defendant? No. What was your purpose in going to the pond at approximately five o'clock p.m. on May thirty first, two thousand nineteen? I was asked to go and um, pick up uh, Michelle with her daughter and her mom, I believe. And where did you, well, did you go to the pond and pick them up? Yes. Was that in the uh, Cherokee? I believe so, yes. And where did you bring them initially? Where? Yes. Back to Fort Jefferson. And was there additional police presence at Fort Jefferson at this time? Or the same amount of police presence? I don't remember. Did you uh, eventually bring anyone to a hotel? Yes. Who did you bring to a hotel? Michelle, mom, and Michelle, daughter. Approximately how much time elapsed between when you were first stopped by Detective Buton and when you left Fort Jefferson Crossing to bring the defendant's mother and daughter to the hotel? I don't remember. Might be an hour. I want to uh, direct your attention now back to the Cayenne seats, which were in the Jeep Cherokee. After you dropped the defendant's mother and daughter at the hotel. Where did you go? I went home. And when you went home, did you change the seats? Yes. Explain to the jury uh, where the Tacoma was when you arrived home in Simsbury. I don't remember if it was in the garage or he was standing outside. Um, it was out of my house. And um, when you uh, changed the seats, can you just describe that process for the jury, how you went about doing that? So I unbolted the, um, the Ford seats that were installed in Tacoma. Um, I took them out and, and I put the uh, Cayenne seats in and the 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 legs of the of the seats, they won't match um, the Tacoma holes in the floor. So I had to cut out the uh, the bottom rails of the Ford seats to transfer them to the the, the, the Cayenne seats. And um, I removed the the seat cover from the I believe the driver's seat and the sponge, so I could get in there with the angle grinder. And I didn't want the seat to catch on fire because it creates a lot of heat and sparks. 
and I took some additional me measurements and and um and I just I just left that like like I was like I just stopped doing it. Well, when you say that you took the seat cover off, what you believe to be the driver's side seat, yep. are you referring to the Ford seats that were in your Tacoma, or are you referring to the Cayenne seats? The Ford seat that was in the Tacoma. And were you able to get both Ford seats out of your Tacoma? Yes. At that point, what did you do with the Cayenne seats? I put them in a in a Tacoma and and um, I put the Tacoma seats next to my truck in the garage. Were you able to fully install the Cayenne seats into the Tacoma? No. Why not? Because I the holes pattern with the Tacoma they they weren't matching. I couldn't bolt them. So what did you do with the Cayenne seats? I just I just put them in the truck and left them there. Did you put them on top of anything? No, I just put them in the cap like where they belong. Just didn't bolt them down. The Ford Focus seats that you removed from your Toyota Tacoma, you indicated that you put them next to the Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury why you did that? I wanted to um, keep them just in case if there's anything going on with the truck. If, if the police is asking about it, I just wanted to keep them next to it. Were you concerned at this point that those seats may have been used in a crime? I have my doubts, but I still, I still couldn't fit in my head that that Dulos would go and um, and do something to Jennifer. And do you recall whether or not you were in touch with Attorney Urso that night also? I don't. I don't remember that. Um, I know at some point um, somehow I got I got connected with with Attorney Urso, but. Well, I want to fast forward to June 2nd, 2019. Did state police personnel show up at your home? That was Sunday? Yes, sir. Yes. Do you recall who showed up? Detective Newton, and I don't remember the other detective name. Approximately what time did Detective Newton and the other detective arrive? I don't remember. By June 2nd, 2019, had you learned that Mr. Dulos had been arrested? Yes. How did you learn that? I believe I saw it on the news. And did you also learn that the defendant had been arrested? I believe so, yeah. Now, did... Uh, Detective Buton and the other detectives speak with you about your whereabouts on May 24th, 2019? Yes. And uh, did Detective Buton indicate that he would be seizing your phone? Yes. And did he ask for consent to search the phone? Yes. And uh, were you willing to provide consent to search the phone? Yes. And I believe, uh, is it true that Attorney Urso spoke with Detective Buton and the other detective at that time on the telephone as well? Yes. And uh, did you did you end up agreeing to have them take your phone? Yeah. So first, first I agree, um, and I and I told them, uh, let me just call my lawyer and and just make sure this is okay. And. Um, I believe Urso told me, uh, you know, they can, they, if they want to seize, they can seize, but they need a warrant to search it. And I told them, listen, I, I, I have nothing to hide. I rather give him 
sign the paper or whatever it was so they can download it and give it back to me quickly. And he agreed with it. And so did Detective Buton take the phone? Yes. And you now know that that phone has been downloaded, correct? Yes. And is it true, sir, it's been brought to your attention that there were deleted items on your phone? Police told me that, yes. Deleted items relating to Can search... Can object to leading nature? Well, first question was, are you now aware that there were deleted items on your phone? And the answer was yes. Now the question is, those deleted items were or referred to... Well, the intermediate question is, do you know what the deleted items were? He indicated the police told counsel, him. Counsel, the intermediate question is, do you know what the deleted items were? Now That's a yes or no. Do you know what those deleted items were? No. Did the police tell you that there had been searches related to the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos on your phone? Um, at some point, yes. Did you do any searches on the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? I'm sure I did, yes. Do you know how those items were deleted from your phone? Well, objection. He didn't know what was deleted, and now he's being asked, does he know how? So, I object. Witness testified he didn't know which items were deleted. So this is not the best witness to determine which items were deleted. So sustain. Uh, Mr. Gumini, you had what type of phone in 2019? I believe that was iPhone 6. And did you... Um, ever clear your search history on your phone? All the time. Why? I just, I just in the habit of doing that. I must have been someone told me a long time ago that there might be slowing down my phone or something. <clears throat> when uh, Detective Buton was at your home did you tell him about the Ford Focus seats that were in your garage, detached from the t Tacoma? I don't believe we have the conversation then, no. Why didn't you tell Detective Newton about the seats at that time? I, I didn't want to talk to them without the presence of my lawyer <clears throat> about that subject. Why not? Because I was on my green card and I was worried that um, I might be charged with something. And did you tell them that you would speak to them again with your attorney present? I told them, um, I asked them to set up a meeting with my me, me and my uh, attorney and, and I can tell them some, give them some more information. Where was the uh, Tacoma parked when Detective Newton was at your residence? It was in the garage. Did Detective Newton and the other uh, detective ever go into your garage at that time? No, they asked me about the license plate and where the truck is, and I told them it's in my garage, um, and I don't remember the license plate. Now, did they eventually leave your house? Yes. And did they return the same day? I believe so, yeah. Approximately how long after they left your house did they return? I don't remember. Why did they return? Well, I'm going to object to that, Your Honor. I would well, you know why the they foundation was sustained. Did the detectives tell you why they were returning? I don't remember. Did the detectives indicate to you whether or not they would be taking the white Jeep chair. Again, I'm going to object to the hearsay nature and the leading question. Well, the focus of the question 
right now is, did they tell you, did the detectives tell you the reason they returned? And so, the objection is hearsay. The court is not certain if it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. If the objection is hearsay, it's overruled. Did the detectives tell you that they were going to be taking the white Jeep Cherokee? Yes. Incidentally, why were you still in possession of the white Jeep Cherokee? Um, I don't know. I just I just had it. I just took it home that Friday, and and it was just at my house. Do you recall a tow truck coming to your house? taking the chair I I don't recall seeing the talk post truck but yeah they took the Jeep so it must must show up at some point <clears throat> and uh, did there come a point in time later on that same week where the police came to your house again yes and I'm referring specifically for the members' benefit to the week of Monday, June 3rd, 2019. Do you recall exactly what day that week they returned? No. Do you remember who came to your house? You, I don't. Does Sergeant Al Bisson sound familiar? Yes. And were you home when they arrived? Yes. What time of day was this? I don't remember. Did Sergeant Bissa make a request of you? Yes, he um, he was asking me um, if there is access to the power line trails from the main road. And I told him that I know of um, at least two places where, where you can access. And so did he ask for your help in locating those places? Yes. And did you agree to go with him? Yeah, he asked me if I can take my vehicle and, and go with him. And um, what vehicle did you take? Um, eventually I took, I took the truck. <clears throat> When you say eventually, you tried to use your wife's vehicle first? Yes. Okay. Why did you do that? Because the, the truck seats were attached to it, and and I just figured that, you know, my, my wife's vehicle would be more better to drive. Now, at this point, had you told Sergeant Bisson about the seats in your garage yet? No. Why not? He didn't ask. What happened after you took your truck? We went, we went up to the top of the Ava mountain and I showed him um, one place where it was like up on the top of the Ava mountain. Um, you have to turn left and then you can access the, the trails. And we missed that. And I, I pulled forward or down with the truck on like a, like a, there's like a parking spot on the right and I was trying to turn around and I stopped and then he pulled right next to me and uh, and he had me a uh, search warrant for my truck. And at that point, did he indicate to you that the, the state police should be taking your Tacoma? Yes. After they told you that they would be taking the Tacoma, what did you do? I told them that um, that's okay. Um, the only thing is the seats that are in the truck are not the seats that were in the truck at the May 24. And I told him to, I asked him if he could go back with, with me to my house to, to take the seats. Did you also um, go through the trails with Sergeant Bisson at any point that day? Um, yeah, I, I, I believe on our way back, we turned into that place where I was trying to show him and I think I took them to West Hartford um, Reservoir. And was that before or after they told you about the search warrant? 
I don't remember. Could have been after. Well, wait, were you in their vehicle or yours? In their vehicle. So it had to be after, yeah. And after you told Sergeant Bisson that the seats that were in the Tacoma hadn't been in the Tacoma previously, what happened next? We drove down to my house and um, I opened the garage door and I gave him the seats. Why did you decide to give Sergeant Bisson the seats at that moment? Because I, don't, I didn't want to be hiding anything. Where did you give Sergeant Bisson the seats? Where? Yeah. At my driveway. Had you put the cover back on the driver's seat at this point, or did you give it to him with the cover? Still? No, I took, I, I kind of kept them separately and all together in one place. They weren't back on, no. Now, I want to uh, direct your attention now to July 12, 2019, so approximately a month or so later. Did you submit to an interview with the state police? Yes. Approximately how long did that interview last? About an eight hours. Who was present for that interview? I know there was uh, me, Lindy Urso, um, Sergeant Buton and some other detective, I don't recall his name. Detective Chris, Chris Allegro? Possible. Where did this interview take place? Um, Stanford. I don't, re I don't remember the address. At a police department? Yes. And during the course of that interview, did you provide a DNA sample to the state police? Yes, I did. Did they have a search warrant for your DNA or did you consent? I consent. And how did they take the DNA sample? They just do a swab on the inside of the chick. And where did the swabbing take place? Where? Yes, sir. Like inside of... No, I'm sorry. Was it at the police department as part of this interview? Yes. Judge, I have some exhibits. I don't know if this is a natural breaking point before we uh, get too far into those. Probably um, it's a natural break. If you wanted to introduce exhibits, it's probably a good idea to introduce them fresh tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude today. We plan to start tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not follow the case on any media. Have a good evening. Delay between the state's case and my case, and, I'm, and I don't want to occur. I want to argue, you know, we have to argue motions, obviously, at some point. But you know, I have people coming from all over the country. So. Well, would not that be just a discussion between you and the state? I, if it, I can't really. Well, let's put it this way. I've been unsuccessful in getting a more definitive answer. I'd rather have something on the record so when the issue arises regarding the delay, at least I have a box, but I'm not going to hold them to it, but give me at least a ballpark. 
Your Honor, what I can indicate is it's very difficult to anticipate, especially during um, to. And I'm sorry, to anticipate based on cross-examination, I have attempted to ensure that the uh, jury is not wasting their time and we have individuals ready to testify up until uh, 4.45. My witnesses I have scheduled for tomorrow, I'm actually going to push back till Thursday because I anticipate counsel will be crossing Mr. Flamini as well as the fact that we're not finished. So we're actually pushing back a day right now. Um, in anticipation, we have a, I really can't, give a estimate right now. I think I'd probably have a better idea uh, after counsel and I can talk tonight and can discuss with attorney Schofer maybe tomorrow morning and see what we can give him a ballpark. But um, realistically, putting on the spot, I can't give you a day. Yeah, it, we can, Your Honor. Well, first, uh, counsel indicated to the court the court indicated to the jury that March 1st was an overestimate. The court does not want to not keep the jury informed as to whether we're going to run up against that overestimate. That would not be fair. So if counsel would discuss the matter, the court can then determine how it will approach the jury if it looks like we're going to hit March 1st. Yes, Judge, we'll discuss that. And actually, just while we're on this topic, I wasn't going to bring this up with the court now, but Attorney Schoenhorn raised the issue of witnesses coming from out of state. Or can Mr. Gimini be excused for oh, this? Oh, yes, maybe. Thank you. I uh, did just want to alert the court that Attorney Schoenhorn has given us two curriculum vitae's for expert witnesses within the last week. I believe we got one on Friday and we received another one today. We have no reports. We have no written explanation as to what they're going to testify to or what they relied on. We seem to be at a little bit of an impasse in terms of what uh, is required in terms of reciprocal discovery. So I did just want to alert the court that we are going to be filing an appropriate motion because um, it seems that the defense just wants to give us the CVs and, and nothing else at this point, um, other than a brief oral summary of what the witnesses may say. And I don't think that that's sufficient under the practice book in our case law. So I did just want to alert the court that we're going to be filing an appropriate discovery motion as if that be heard sooner than later, um, because as we discuss scheduling, the state may very well move for quarter hearings on some of the proposed testimony, depending on what they indicate they're going to be uh, introducing. I want to be very clear. The practice book has been followed to the letter. There is nothing in the practice book that requires a person that we consult with to write a report. The CVs that we provide, in one case, it's like 50 pages long. So it's patently obvious what that individual is going to be testifying about. The other is also apparent from their field of, of expertise what they're going to testify about. Until there was certain testimony, I didn't even know that we would even need those witnesses. The fact that I had consulted with people over the years doesn't make them witnesses. So he can file whatever he wants. I have complied with what the practice book requires. The court cannot order an expert witness to prepare a report just because the state wants one. Well, the court will take a look at the motion. What hasn't been done is to disclose them. Have those names been disclosed on that witness list to the jury? Well, if Your Honor will recall, the uh, list we provided was not a list of witnesses. So they, the, the, uh, the fact that these two individuals were not on that, well, I don't even know if they were on the list. I can't recall. But assuming they were not on the list, these are people that until there was the states, uh, as soon as they, it became apparent that they may be called as witnesses, I provided the state with uh, their extensive curriculum vitae. So 
other than that, and I gave them an oral discussion of what they're going to testify to. It's not scientific evidence, so there's no quarter hearing that is required. So that's just a red herring. Yeah, that's not true, Judge, and I'll file the appropriate motion. I just, if the court wants to get a head start on the reading, I would direct the court to State versus Manusis. I don't have the exact site, but uh, that'll point you in the right direction in terms of what the defense's obligations might be and what your discretion is in the interest of justice and fairness to the state who is an interested party in this case. Thank you. So tomorrow, uh, Attorney McGinnis, how much more on direct do you think that you have? Approximately an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. So the court would anticipate the whole day on cross. That's what the court would anticipate. Well, and since we don't even have an approximate date of the conclusion, I want the court to at least be aware now, I would probably have at least four days, full days of defense testimony. So if the court takes that into consideration in terms of where the state is going, the state has been putting everything that they have relevant or not in the record. So if there's any delay, it certainly isn't due to cross-examination. It was by the thorough, I'm, so I'm not suggesting it improper, but the thorough, perhaps over-thorough presentation by the state. But if there's any delay, it is not due to cross-examination. Most of my crosses have been relatively brief, considering the length of the direct. Well, what the court recalls in discussions with both counsel is that the state was attempting to conclude by the 22nd. And so four court days, defense testimony would leave us the 23rd, the 26th, 27th, and the 28th. So if that is the schedule right now, of course we are running up against the overestimate, but the court has indicated to the jury that the amount of time you spend deliberating is up to you. We'll stand adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. All rise. This honorable Superior Court.